Yeah. Sam Brooks has this down to a science. Good morning, everybody. As Ayla Brooke and the Sound Men wrap up, here we are with the Friday edition of Real Talk uh, coming at you. Uh, 8.30 Mountain Time, 10.30 Eastern. Thanks to everybody that's tuned in. Thanks to everybody that's already joining us. I'm just, I feel like I want to sort of, uh, I want to see a little bump start to my morning here. I want to see a little positive infusion, some encouragement out of the gates. And so uh, I'm just going to go check out our live YouTube comments thread. All right, it's Leth View who gets the shout out today with the first good morning. And it's not just any good morning. It's good morning, Real Talkers. Very well done. It's a fun little contest we're it running is, every It day. is a fun little contest. So how does this, so you go, uh, by the way, great show in store today. Uh, you're very much going to look forward, I think, uh, to a few different key points. If you're trying to make sense of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Well CEO Adam O'Brien's joining us, our Real Talk Friday roundtable right today. Now. Is he ready to go? He's ready to go. He's okay. throwing pitches. He's warming up his oh, arm yeah. as we speak. All yeah. right. <clears throat> Our roundtable today. In his, uh, in, his, in his cheek. <laughs> Adam lives pretty clean. I don't think Adam would be down with Chew. <laughs> I think Chew might be the last thing that Adam would be. We'll, we'll ask him. That'll be our. That'll be. Our, we ask the tough questions here on Real Talk. That'll be the tough one. We're Chew going to talk about Alberta's me. next thirty uh, coming up at our Real Talk roundtable, and then we've got a couple of scientists uh, coming up just after ten o'clock today that will answer the important question: Is selenium just salt? We talked to Robin Campbell yesterday of the Coal Association of Canada. Uh, Colton Vesey will join us, an environmental geochemist who works with mining. And reclamation projects. Uh, John Adcock is a biologist and an environmental and engineering consultant. Uh, he's also going to join us. <clears throat> They'll join us together. You know, iron will sharpen iron here. So I'll look forward to that conversation around 10 o'clock. If you take a look back at our body of work this week, this is how. So this show is relatively new, right? We're just wrapping up our eighth week. As a matter of fact, we went on the air on November 23rd. So we're relatively new. So someone said to me yesterday, a guy reached out and said, um, by the way, he was wearing sunglasses in his profile photo. I don't know. It's like the people that annoy me the most on social media always have sunglasses on in their profile photos. And they're typically behind the wheel of a vehicle in the profile photo. They, they kind of have their chins up. They're behind the wheel of a vehicle and they have their sunglasses on. That's And, and then they typically have a bunch of like flags like flags in their profile, you know what I'm saying? And then yeah. sometimes, you know, you know, you know the. I, like I, I am, I am guilty of having sunglasses in a previous profile photo, but I was like sitting on a beach with my sunglasses on. I feel like that's a little bit of a different vibe. Let me be clear here: not all sunglasses. <laughs> all I'm saying is that there's a con- there's a consistent trend. People that typically tend to annoy me on social media, and you're going, Ryan, it's Friday. Why at 8.33 are you talking about what's annoying you? Why, why, why aren't you positive? The weekend is upon us, dude. Everything's great. The, the pod board team has just contacted us. Uh, they're based out of London, England, Stockholm, Sweden. They've let us know that Real Talk is back on top after yesterday's show. Number one, again, the most downloaded daily news podcast in Canada. So thank you for that. Things are positive. But this tweet, just and people are yesterday, so I see this tweet, we're number one, people are going, great interviews, great show, love it, subscriptions are up, more and more people subscribing to our YouTube channel, more and more people subscribing to our podcast, but there was this one tweet, you know, sometimes it's just one thing, it's just the one thing. This is the purple shirt all over again. And this guy was watching my interview with Robin Campbell, he must have been, or maybe he, what I think he may have been guilty of is because if you follow me on Twitter at Ryan Jesperson, you know that every day, thanks to Sam, Sam does all the editing work behind the scenes, we release, Twitter allows us to release up to a two-minute, 20-second clip. So we want to release highlights of each of our interviews along with the link to the full interview. And so I released a two, and Sam, usually you usually get it to like 219 or like 219 and a half. I mean, half. sometimes I don't need the full 220. Sometimes right. 40 seconds is enough. But I mean, yeah, a lot, a lot of times I'm just like, I got to trim this a little bit here. And it's like, oh, maybe I can just delete this word and try and just like hit that post right there. I so, learned it. I learned yeah. it watching my parents back in the day. Uh, we used to. I don't know if maybe they still do it from their beautiful home down in Calgary, the two of them, as they watch Real Talk every morning. But, but back in the day, my parents would make freshly squeezed orange juice. Like when you, you, you see, you know what I'm talking about? This is why I never really blamed Bev Oda. Uh, really good orange juice is you worth need like 16 eight bucks. <laughs> you need, that's going to be the quote people use from today's show. He's giving Bev Oda a pass. Why are you giving? We are going to talk about political entitlement today, by the way. Don't worry. 
But in all seriousness, watching my parents make this freshly squeezed orange juice back in the day, it's like they'd like give it the good first twist. But then you'd notice if you'd circle back and give that half of orange another good twist, you could get more juice out. And so sometimes Sam will use the full two minute 20 to get the point across. And sometimes, like you said, the powerful punch clip will be like 55, 60 seconds, whatever the case may be. So this guy reaches out to me. He sees me talking to he, he sees a portion of the interview talking to Robin Campbell, president of the Coal Association of Canada yesterday. And I say to Robin, in your correspondence with me, this is the first question. First question I asked him, I said, in your correspondence with me off air, you said that, you know, because we reach out, we're going to talk to him. This is this is what Real Talk's all about. So, you know, for example, on open pit coal mining, we're going to talk to the ranchers that are really ticked off, including country music star uh, Cor Blunt, who joined us. Did you see Paul Brandt joining the yeah. chorus as well, by the way? Pretty significant. We're waiting on Ian Tyson, Terry Clark, Brett Kissel. We'll wait on all the other Alberta country stars to start chiming in on this. Talk to farmers. Talk to journalists. Talk to uh, environmental advocates. We'll talk to tourism operators like the, those that are, you know, running, for example, you know, angling tourism outfitters or things like that. Like, you know, people that care about the future, not just the now. People that care about more than just returns and, and – um, your, your mic's hot, just an FYI, so we are hearing clearly everything. You, 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 slamming doors, <laughs> snapping elastics, just having a, a great old time I'm over looking there. for another pen and and yeah. found it next to the stud finder this is my in the drawer. This is my politest way of saying kill your mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this 30-second this opening comment is taking seven minutes. because we are. It turns out we're actually having a lot of fun this morning. But we're hitting a number of different angles. So you're going to hear from the journalists, you're going to hear from the ranchers, you're going to hear from the celebrities, you're going to hear from the farmers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously we're going to hear from big coal. Like, I mean, it's not the type of show we're just going to argue one angle all the time and then try to convince you of that. We want to make you uncomfortable sometimes. We're going to bring on people that, that from time to time you're not going to agree with. You're going to be, in some cases, probably upset and disappointed that they're on the show. You know, there's a bit of a there's part of today's culture is like, why are you platforming this person? Why are you giving this person a platform? Right. Why are you bringing them in and platforming them? And we're not bringing in the Ku Klux Klan. We're not bringing in neo-Nazis. We're not bringing in, you know, extremists along those lines. But we will pick people's brains and we will try to understand people. You know, next week, for example, I think Western separation is 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 like the dumbest idea I've ever heard of in my life. But Jay Hill's coming on next week, leader of the Maverick Party, the Western Separatist Party, former Stephen Harper minister, like former high profile federal politician now leading the Maverick Party. He's joining us next week on the show. That's one example of many. So we're talking to Robin Campbell uh, yesterday, and, and, he, and I basically say, OK, well, in your emails to me, you know, leading up to this interview, you've, you've been telling me that there's a lot of misinformation out there that needs to be corrected. So are you saying that the environmentalists are you saying that the scientists are lying? And he says, if you saw the interview, you know, you can go back and watch it. We're going to play it again for you in the 10 o'clock hour, a portion of it. He says, well, I'm not a scientist, but selenium, which will leak into the water inevitably as a, as a result of this mining activity in the Rockies. He says selenium is basically just salt. And the Internet exploded. And then I asked him in follow up, which I think sunglasses Twitter guy maybe didn't watch. I said, well, OK, hang on. And I started reading comments from some of you that were like, OK, Robin, you're a fishing guide. You know, would you would you fish and eat the fish from downstream of Elk River, this, that and the other? And he's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. I would eat that fish. And you're probably going, no, I wouldn't. But this guy reaches out to me and he says. Would have been nice if you at least knew enough to tell him that selenium's not just salt. Would have been nice. And originally, like my initial, because I can be immature like everybody else, my initial, I start like, oh, yeah, you start like, oh, yeah, you want to, would have been nice if maybe you, you know, took your sunglasses off for your profile shot, buddy. Would have been nice if maybe, you know, and then I'm like, oh, come on. But the point is, sometimes it's a talk host job to, to give people rope and let them do with it as they will. Sometimes it's, it's a talk host job to bring on, to platform different people and bring them on and, and have them. Put things out there for your digestion, for your consumption. And then what we do, it's part of the art of talk show production, is we bring on other people to respond to that. And what we do is we create an ongoing conversation that grabs the public attention. And that's probably why so many people watched our interview yesterday with Robin Campbell. So today, for 
one of the nice guy and everybody else, we bring you two biologists, environmental geochemists that are going to come on the show and talk about selenium and some of their concerns about mining. And then I think that that will wrap up nicely with a bow on top, a week's worth of conversation on an issue that matters to Canadians, in particular, Western Canadians, as the Alberta government has rescinded a 50 year old coal policy. So some of their buddies can come in, lop the tops off mountains. And the pro- you know how much the province of Alberta is going to make on this? It's like the forecasts are like $2 million a year. To put that into perspective, the, the provincial budget is like $45 billion. Well, I mean, before COVID, before everything, let's, let's just talk about like n- sort of normal times. The provincial budget's typically like around $45 billion. They're... The, the province is, is ignoring mayors and reeves and fire chiefs and everybody else and consolidating 911 service. Everybody's sounding the alarm about this to save $7 million. And they're allowing multinational companies. I mean, you think of the word like foreign, how, how this government uses the word foreign, like foreign interests against our oil. Foreign and foreign. Well, they're allowing foreign companies to come in and lop the tops off our mountains so Alberta can add about Two million bucks a year into the coffers. There are people watching this right now that make two million bucks a year. A lot of money for us. Not a lot of money for the province of Alberta. Talk like this. This show is made possible each and every morning because the team at Bitcoin Well has our back as our presenting sponsors. What a time to be keeping an eye on Bitcoin. You probably have a lot of questions. Here's the thing. Typically... At this time, in our opening read, we'll call it, I tell you if you have questions about Bitcoin, any questions about crypto, to check out Bitcoin well under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com and get in touch with them today, my friends. We bring you the founder and CEO of the company, and I'm going to be keeping an eye on the Real Talk RJ hashtag. I'm also going to be keeping an eye on the live YouTube comments, and we're going to ask your questions to Adam O'Brien, who's coming up right now. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right. I love these comments here on our live. Uh, we got to. We just have. Sometimes we got to keep it real and acknowledge how bad that sounded. That opener. It was we bad. Figure that out. It was bad. Yeah, it is gotta, an ongoing. It's like uh, it's like watching. Have you ever seen somebody hiking with a pack that's like forty pounds heavier than it should be? I'm talking about myself because it's full of wine and whiskey when you should just be hiking with freeze dried foods. That's what that reminds me of. We prioritize different things. <laughs> My pack is always heavy because I go packing with like all the camera gear. All the camp. That's another yeah, one. Yeah, right. It's just another. Like you, you don't you don't hike up a mountain without being able to take the great photo of it. Something else the fellas tell me that that I could probably drop weight on. I think our opener is rolling again. Something else I could drop weight on. What a morning. I could drop weight on is uh, I hike with tartar sauce. <laughs> Just in case. For the fish you catch? Yeah, for the fish we catch. Okay, I get that. Yeah. Well, what else? Yeah, obviously for the fish. <laughs> I, I, I mean, like, I've I've brought fresh lemons with me yes. before, but always never tartar worth it. sauce. Always worth it. Yeah. Fresh lemons will always be worth it. Let's get to our opening. I'm really excited to have Adam O'Brien joining us this morning. He's the founder and CEO of Bitcoin Solutions. We, we have now 10 questions for you already. Number one, uh, I, I already know the answer to this. Do you or do you not chew tobacco? I do not chew tobacco. No, no. <laughs> you don't. You don't. You don't drink. You don't smoke. I think of. I think of all the people that I. I mean, you. You are a personal friend of mine. We golf together all the time, et cetera. You're a pretty clean living guy. Did you ever? Well, I golf so good. Yeah, that is why you golf. <laughs> people, can I? Can I say? Can I comment on your stature in your golf game for a second? Like what? <laughs> I was being facetious. No, well, I'm not. What are you? Are you like five ten or something like that? Ish. Uh, I'm like like my my height is like. Five eight, I think. Yeah, you're five eight, and you're one sixty or something like that ish. One six five, my man. You're five. You're five <laughs> eight, one sixty five, and you stripe the ball about. I've seen it. I've seen it fifty times. Uh, about three hundred ten yards, I would say, down the fairway ish. Three twenty, probably. Yeah, it's, a, it's all in the hips, baby. Is that is that is that actually what see is that actually what it is in the hips? Because because if if, if, well, five, yeah. if five eight one sixty five can hit it three hundred plus. Like you've seen me, if I hit it 240, I'm like, I'm buying everybody beers. I'll buy you a Gatorade anytime. That's that's also the reason why I can shake it so good because my swing, like when it's when, when it's timed, like just perfectly, I can I can hit the ball pretty good. But 
if there's if there's an ounce of of mistiming uh, at any point in my swing, then it just is is a total mess. Well, like it, like <laughs> anybody else, uh, I can't wait to be golfing. Uh, by the way, but it's way too yeah. soon. It's way too soon to start thinking about that. We still have months. Um, <clears throat> Adam, we we we, re- we reached out to you. Um, there's been so much going on. Uh, I don't even know where to start, really. But a lot of the uh, geopolitical unrest and a lot of the things that we've. I mean, obviously, there's nothing new here that that political unrest can affect markets and investor confidence and stock markets can be impacted. Uh, same goes with crypto. It turns out. So I want to kind of just tee it up and, and, and let you stream your thoughts. Uh, back on January 6th, you know, Sam and I are sitting in here watching our monitor. Our, our jaws are just dropped as we're watching Capitol Hill <laughs> stormed by people taking over the Senate chamber. I mean, it was just cr- craziness. And, and running parallel is the storyline. Crypto is just rocketing. Like, you know, as a, as a buddy of mine said, as the Capitol falls, Bitcoin rises. Uh, then after we obviously see a little bit of a correction and it drops a little bit back down to earth. What have you observed in the past, let's say, week and a half and, and what sense can you make of it for us? Yeah, man. I mean, it's it's been absolutely wild to watch um, just just how much steam Bitcoin has behind it. And, and what I mean by that is like to be to be honest, um, this this run that we're seeing doesn't surprise me too much. But I do think that what's surprising is how many people, how many, uh, uh, the word important people sounds, sounds wrong coming out of my mouth, but we'll, 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 we'll say people with, with large platforms and people that traditionally don't really like Bitcoin, um, just how excited they are about Bitcoin. I mean, the likes of Michael Saylor, for example, is, is just crazy. Um, you see PayPal that like three years ago was like inherently Bitcoin is from the devil and we will never, ever touch Bitcoin. And if you do, then you're a horrible human. And now they're like, hey, look, we sell Bitcoin now, so make sure you sign up for our platform. Exactly. Um, we have we have all kinds of – I think the narrative has, has changed on Bitcoin, and I think it's out of necessity, out of what you're talking about. People are realizing that political unrest um, is not good for a dollar that's controlled by those that are causing or a part of the unrest. And so um, – I think that the fact that people are flocking in droves into into Bitcoin, a decentralized commodity, um, I think it it shows you know quite well for what the power of Bitcoin can be. So you, but you'll have people that are, um, you know that that are going okay. I've had my concerns, I've had my questions, but I think I've seen enough. I think I've I think I've seen all I need to see. So I'm going to go buy Bitcoin. Uh, you know, maybe maybe they see. Um, I was telling you what's hey what's the name of I'm asking you to do my job for me now but who's that the the, <laughs> the Greek guy that I watched a video of that I told you about Anthopolis or not Anthopolis Andreas An- Andreas Anthonopoulos. An- Anthonopoulos and so I'm watching a yeah. video of him talking about Bitcoin for example and and he's bullish as are you and other and so I'm watching all these people and trying to learn as much as I can and I know I'm sure not alone on that and there are people saying well some people say I think Bitcoin could go could could hit 150 grand US I think I think it could hit 200 grand US so people last week are looking and they go, what was it at? Like 40 grand you or 35 us or something like that for it's at 46, right. can, 46 Canadian right now. I just checked, uh, unless it's surging as a result of our conversation. And, and, uh, and so you get people that'll buy it, you know, they go, okay, there's still room to go. I've had my questions. I've had my questions answered and they, and they, they, they invest, you know, five grand or they invest 500 grand or they do whatever. And then all of a sudden in five hours, it falls like 5,000 US and they go, oh my gosh, I've made a terrible mistake. How Panic sell, where's the panic button? Panic sell, <laughs> sell, sell, sell. And then, they've, and then they've lost money and then they go, oh, I should have learned my lesson. I should have stayed with, with grandpa's <laughs> investor who told me to slow and steady wins the race. How do you, how do you kind of, because it is a very, it's ve- the fact is it's very volatile. You must have to have, I mean, you're either in this a day trader or long game, right? Yeah, I have I have yet to meet a day trader in this industry that um, hasn't been been wrecked R E K T wrecked um, at least a, a a couple of times. I think that what what I always say when someone's buying Bitcoin is is you pick your date um, that you just you, you don't, it's not even it's not even possible to touch it until then. You have to you have to pick your date, and then and then I tell them to just zoom out. When you look at the history of Bitcoin, it's it's just over a decade old now. And um, I mean, if you look at the chart, like the the massive 30, 40, 50 percent crashes that we've seen, you know, four, five, six years ago look like little tiny anthills um, on the chart. Because when you zoom out, you realize uh, how powerful Bitcoin is. And 
uh, when you when you see, I mean, earlier this year it was it was, I think it crashed to uh, forty five or five grand U.S. dollars, um, and today it's 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 literally up ten times, um, you know what it what it had crashed to, and um, I think that that proves testament to the fact that if you zoom out, you have strong hands, you're able to hold your Bitcoin. You should never ever be investing what you can't afford to lose in this. This is not a get rich quick um, thing, although people can get rich quick <laughs> buying Bitcoin. Um, I think that it's it's very short sighted to to buy Bitcoin and then sell it for a ten or a twenty percent return. Um, I've and I've done that before. I've in the past. I've 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 purchased uh, Bitcoin with that mindset, and I think that the the strongest and and best mindset is to is to just have one percent. I've said that. I think on this show, I think uh, one of my colleagues has has commented that on this show was was what finally kind of got them. I was like, oh hey, you know, one percent is not that scary. And if I lose one percent of my portfolio, you know, that's that's probably fine um, for my longevity and my retirement and my my lifelong savings. But uh, that one percent could in fact be like the best investment you ever ever make. And um, I think that going at it with like a sound mind like that really would help our entire society into into financial sovereignty. Yeah, I mean, well, you talk to any financial advisor, I don't care who they represent or, or who they're dealing with or how old they are, how much experience they have. They're going to talk about diversifying. Uh, nobody would recommend. Um, I'm trying to decide if I should tell a personal story right now or not. We, <laughs> you know, you know, some people have like these. Um, I'll keep it general, but there, you know, you, you can have uh, like these sort of, um, and I'm not an investment advisor and that'll become evident very quickly as I try to explain what I'm talking about, but typically through employers or things like that, you can get these locked in, um, kind of RSPs, right. Uh, uh, and, and, but you can't touch them, you can't get them out. And so, uh, so, you know, you kind of, I find you end up sort of like setting them and forgetting them, right? Like someone else is managing them. You're not involved. You're not whatever. So my wife had one and we, we took a look at it and all of a sudden like the quarterly report comes in or whatever and it was like way down, like way down, like 35% down in a short period of time. So I, I call my buddy in St. Albert and I said, hey, can you just, you know, and that's always a bit of an awkward conversation too, to send a financial report from another manager to your buddy to say, <laughs> can you explain it? And his, his answer could simply just be like, maybe I should be managing your money, which now long story short he is um so i said can you make sense of this like what's going on with this and he goes oh my gosh and he kind of looks into it he says the entire fund is three pipelines like <laughs> the the entire fund was three pipeline projects and like we're not paying attention it was not our primary kind of it was just kind of one of these things and he's like oh yeah, my i mean that's you know i mean what a what a ter what a terrible and maybe if you hit on it then great well, same with double zero at the at the casino. <laughs> yeah, at roulette, exactly. I don't think either of us are, are are going to the casino dumping our life savings on double zero. Yeah, no kidding. Well, let me ask you this: so we what actually do you mean? go ahead, Adam. Quickly about that about that um, that RSP matching fund or whatever. We actually just launched um, at our company um, here in, in Edmonton. So we have about forty uh, team members, and we launched a a Bitcoin matching program. So you can uh, des delegate. Uh, a percentage of your pay into Bitcoin, and we will match that in place of that kind of RSP matching, uh, which we were super excited about. And we had an incredible response from the team. People, um, you know, of course, like very excited. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's free Bitcoin. So who doesn't like, well, not free, you have to work for it, but <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. But this is, and, you would, uh, you would I, obviously, yeah. you would, you would attract a real, like I'd be fascinated not just to see I've met some of your team members some of them have helped me out personally but but I would even just the people that apply your bank of resumes you you must have cuz cuz you're not going to apply to work at Bitcoin well if you don't believe in Bitcoin or if you're not pretty excited about it right so you, you, is is there a certain type of person that's into Bitcoin um, do you think or are you seeing a pretty diverse sample size Yeah now it is fairly diverse. I know that like a few years ago, we had a hard time attracting talent because um, because of, of that exact reason. People were like, Bitcoin, don't understand it. Maybe don't even believe in it. Um, you know, I'm not going to go work for this company. It's going to be dead in a year. And um, but but now, I mean, we're we're so lucky. We we've, we've really seen kind of some pretty serious growth. And I think that we've shown that we're the real deal. And uh, the people that are applying now are, you know, everyone from a, a deemed no coiner, which is someone that, you know, might it might insinuate you don't have any Bitcoin 
or right through to like, oh yeah, I found Bitcoin in 2012. I've been following it, never really pulled the trigger, but it's always interested me. Uh, you know, I can't wait to get involved to like, you know, our chief revenue officers, like been in Bitcoin longer than I have. And, and that right? uh, him and I, have, we've, we've been working together kind of as like friendly competitors for a long time. And now we've joined forces and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, we, we have everyone kind of on, on the spectrum of, I don't have Bitcoin or I do, but yeah. now in the company, you know, for Christmas, we gave everyone like a Bitcoin gift card and, and, uh, That's so cool. now everyone has at least had the opportunity to have Bitcoin. Uh, somebody Smurfy is watching and wonders, is there a Bitcoin mutual fund? There are funds that are, that are, that yeah. deal with Bitcoin, right? But it's not like buying Bitcoin. You're, what, what are, exa what exactly are you buying into on stuff like that? So a Bitcoin ETF, which, um, the stock, uh, three IQ is the, the Bitcoin fund. So the company is three IQ. Their product is called the Bitcoin fund. And that is a fund on the TSX that you can gain exposure or um, kind of price exposure really to the price of Bitcoin. Now, the fund price, the fund stock price does track the price of Bitcoin pretty closely. Um, so if, if Bitcoin goes up, the fund that holds Bitcoin will also <laughs> go up as as market economics would, would dictate. Um, the, the problem with that is that you're not actually buying Bitcoin. You don't have custody of your funds, so you couldn't. Um, you, you couldn't use that Bitcoin. You're, you know, you're at the fund or the or the TSX's mercy when or if you can sell them. Um, there's there's no real peer to peer aspect, which is kind of the underlying value of Bitcoin is that the fact that you you have financial sovereignty and the fact that you own and control your funds. I think um, here's here's what's happening right as we have like three minutes left in our interview. But but don't worry, we can go a little into overtime. Um, now the questions are starting to like now we're getting major questions. I think I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Chaim says Bitcoin's about to be regulated away. Uh, yeah, probably. Um, Chaim had that same thought about the Internet in 1995. And um, I think that. If Bitcoin can get regulated, certainly people can regulate Bitcoin. And I think that it would be very difficult for a, a kind of global uh, regulation to happen. And I would suspect that if one country over regulates Bitcoin, another country would probably under regulate it in order to get all of the, you know, people like myself, the Bitcoin entrepreneurs uh, flocking into their country, getting their to like we pay an exuberant amount of taxes here, and uh, and I think that that other countries would see the benefit in having a very safe and consumer benefiting commodity or Bitcoin as cryptocurrency, um, you know, regulated and, and in the market in their country. Okay. Um, I want to let real talkers know. So typically we try to hit the news right around nine o'clock. We want you to know what's going on in the world. We want you to be able to, you know, talk to your friends and neighbors and, and, and be in the know, so to speak. Um, we're going to keep Adam. Can I keep you for a few minutes? I know you have a busy, yeah. yeah, we can keep you for, let's say 10 minutes. We'll do the news in about 10 minutes, everybody. Okay. And then we'll start our real talk round table just a little bit after that. So just, there's no reason to rush. We're doing whatever we want here. Uh, we're unregulated too, which is pretty awesome. I mean, if if you bring tartar sauce on a hike, I don't know what rules you live. There's by. no rules anymore. <laughs> I'm here. I'm hearing from. I'm getting some tweets from from like, and I'm going to say purists. I mean, I I'm I'm an angler. I'm I'm a purist to a certain degree ish. Uh, but some of them just. Uh, we've got Chad Park on with me right now. I need Adam back. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what's going on today uh we got so but but the purists are saying it is it is absolute is it is a disgrace to put tartar sauce on a freshly caught rocky mountain trout but i and disagree right. no no i disagree there's something about hiking 50 or 60 k in with tartar sauce and then as as your fish your fish is barely it's just bare it's almost still alive and and sorry, this is just the reality. And and then the tartar. Oh, I mean, I mean, <laughs> let's get back to this. Scott wonders. So now, Adam, because you could go on this for three hours, but we don't have that time. Yeah. And let's also acknowledge that, like, my apologies to, to people like Mark, who's watching in from Utah. Mark's got some pretty high level questions, which would be good. But the majority of us will be lost with those questions. So I want to kind of stick in the middle ground. So, so I don't want to ask you the questions that are easily answerable with with like a Wikipedia search, and I don't want to get too high level. But Scott has a good. He says, "What generates what generates Bitcoin? Like, where does the value come from?" He says, "I get that fiat currency. So, in other words, they're talking, you know, Canadian dollar, American dollar, British pound, sterling, etc. Um, I get that fiat currency is backed by central banks, but what backs Bitcoin?" Yeah. Um to be to be clear, central banks aren't backed by anything, though. So the fact that that something backs 
out of the thing if it itself isn't backed by anything means nothing um which is a kind of a, a bigger you know kind of uh zoom out and have a look at what's actually backing what you claim is important um the market and the network of people using that market back uh bitcoin the fact that houses have value is because everyone agrees that we it's nicer to live in shelter than it is to not and so therefore we all hold high value to houses same thing with cars um i don't know like trucks right now you can you can go buy a gorgeous truck and it's going to cost you like for, i think they lease them for like not or finance them for like nine or ten years you'll be paying you know hard-earned money for for nine or ten years for for a truck uh probably it's going to cost you 60 70 grand over the course of, of its lifetime they're like 90 because now. we or, or 90 grand yeah. like we you know be, and, and that's because we we assume it has not because it's backed by anything but because we as a society have deemed that this is valuable and i want this in my life i will spend my money on this um in my life and so bitcoin has the same kind of kind of market um effect where uh it's just like like any other market people people have seen value in bitcoin because they know what it holds and they know the fact that it has a peer-to-peer -peer network and it is not controlled by any one central body um, that is the safest form of money that we can have on planet earth. And so that's kind of where the value is, is, is driven from. Luke, uh, brings up a story that I've, I've had a lot of people, actually people that are, that are engaging with the show regularly have written in to say that the next time you're on, they want me to ask you about this. This is just an anecdotal story. You've probably heard about this guy that has two password attempts left. Luke says, anybody see the story of the guy? That, have you heard about this, Adam? This guy? No, I haven't. Oh, well, I, I, know I mean, exactly you'll, where it's going. <laughs> you know exactly where it's going. You, you could probably tell the story without hearing the details because this guy's not alone. But there's a guy that, that claims that he bought Bitcoin way back when, when it was like 200 bucks or something or 500 bucks or something like that. Anyway, he estimates his holdings now are worth $220 million or so. Let's call it a quarter billion. But he can't remember the password to his computer. He claims he has two password attempts left before his hard drive is wiped i mean it sounds like he should pay some pretty serious money to some pretty talented people <laughs> that you probably don't find in the in the, in the uh, top level of the internet <laughs> in yeah but this this happens to be right there are people that 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 got into bitcoin way back when and then probably either yeah. lost track of it or whatever and then now they're looking at what it's worth and they're trying to access it and they can't that is a thing right yeah and and that's uh, absolutely and, and that's why like you know, uh, Uncle Ben said, with great power comes great responsibility. Anytime you are going to take full control of your money, uh, you have to take full control of your money. You can't just like set it and forget it. Like, you know, the story of your of your pipeline RSP is, is a perfect example of that. You know, at least if you had control of that, you would have at least had the choice to be negligent. <laughs> Whereas you left it in the hands of somebody else to be negligent. And, uh, and, and that's unfortunate. And so, so, you know, unfortunately for, for the story of the guy that was an early adopter and, and um, you know, can't remember his password, he has no one to blame but himself. <laughs> and uh, there is a certain level of, of responsibility that comes with holding your own money. Just like if you're walking around town with a thousand bucks in your pocket uh, and, and you go to pull out your phone and the thousand dollars drops out and it flies away, that's not really the Canadian dollar's fault. That's just your own fault for being a little bit negligent with the money that you had access and full control of. And so um, definitely if you are buying Bitcoin, make sure you back it up, make sure you keep it safe on a uh, self custodied kind of cold storage or hardware wallet. Um, I'm using terms that are in the industry and, and I'll self plug here. Definitely visit the team at Bitcoin. Well, and, and we can like certainly get people kind of in tune with the best practices to secure the most valuable asset on planet earth. David Rosenberg in the Financial Post, it's, uh, it's just out yesterday, wrote a piece why comparisons between Bitcoin and gold are absurd. OK, so so there's a, bit, a lot of people are comparing Bitcoin and gold these days. Um, gold obviously used as a store of value for thousands of years, um, relatively easily understood asset. Although, I mean, I've always wondered, like, I mean, gold's also one of those things that's so valuable because we say it's so valuable, right? Yeah, what's I mean, gold backed by? <laughs> like, well, but but even if you, I mean, if you think about it, now this might be somewhat of a naive statement. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, but but if you took like a gold brick and if you took a, a, a construction brick, a, a brick from an old building that got knocked down, um, in Edmonton, we're really good at that, knocking down old buildings. So you take an old brick uh, from any one of our beautiful historic buildings that we've knocked down for parking lots. And uh, but if you looked at them, the gold bricks shinier and heavier, maybe. But but I mean, you know, I mean, if you said one's worth 80 cents and one's worth fourteen hundred dollars, uh, I guess I'd have to take your word for it. A, a visitor to planet Earth would have to take our word for it. 
people are comparing gold and Bitcoin anyway. In the Financial Post, David Rosenberg writes, and I, and I want to read the quote so you can respond to it. He says, comparisons to gold and Bitcoin are baseless. He says, nobody ever talks about the risk that gold could go to zero because it simply can't. There's a floor in its price because it has physical properties that make it useful even outside of its primary function as a safe haven asset. But Bitcoin, which has marginal intrinsic value, relies on the faith of its holders that's worth more than nothing and that the technology is sound. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, that's, no, that's super wrong. That's, that's a really stupid statement. Okay, let's hear um, Well, if, if, if we discover, and this is unlikely, but we'll use hyperbolic analogies for the sake of, of explanation. If we discover that Mount Everest, if we dig you know, a few miles beneath the surface, it's, it's, it's all gold. Um, the, the price of gold would likely drop significantly because what drives gold's price is scarcity and gold has an unknown scarcity, um, because we have actually no idea how much gold yeah. there is on the earth. We just, don't, we just know how much we've discovered. Yeah. Don't tell, by the way, don't tell the Alberta government that Everest is made of gold or they'll try to buy Nepal. Anyway, carry on, <laughs> carry on. <I'm> fired. <laughs> Um, the, the other, the fact that it has physical properties is, is hilarious in my mind because, uh, it, there's a lot of metals that are, do a lot of what gold is like good for better than gold that are worth way less. Like, um, you know, depending on what you need it for gold, the, the reason gold has weight is because gold had weight like ages ago and it was, it was the most valuable rock ages ago. But today there are, there are metals, I mean, depending on what you're using it for, like we we bleach gold in order to make it look a different way so that we can use it so it looks closer to silver and if you know I, I know that there's there's hardness properties and I'm not a metals expert but um, the physical aspect of gold is ridiculous because nobody makes anything out of gold for a, for utility purpose they make it out of out of it's either status or it's out of um, you know value storage so I don't agree that gold I don't disagree that gold is a good store of value I just think that you need a forklift to move a million dollars in gold. And I can carry a million dollars in Bitcoin in my pocket. So which one is like more useful um, to you? If you have a forklift handy all the time, then having a million dollars of gold is very accessible. and That's very good. And if you don't have a forklift, then I would suggest that you should buy Bitcoin. I've, I've always kind of wondered, too. And again, I'm not a financial analyst. I'm not an expert, but but I, I'm, a, I'm a practical person. I'm a realist. And, and I've always thought, too, if if the apocalypse went down and, and if markets crashed <laughs> and if, if people's asset you know, balance sheets were wiped and all these types of things, but you were holding physical gold. Um, even then, and I'm picturing like my, my imagination right now, I'm envisioning Mad Max, like, you know, just yeah. wild scenarios. You know, a jerry can of gasoline is worth whatever, whatever you want to trade it for because money has no value anymore and, and all these types. And you're in this type of scenario. Even a gold brick then is like, you're, yeah, it's pretty useless. Well, it's like because you're the only reason that even that would have value. Number one would be like as a murder weapon, I guess, uh, or um, <laughs> or doing your best to try to to. You look like you want to say something. Let me. I'll let you jump in in a second. But it, but to me, it looks like like you all, the gold brick only has value if you have optimism or belief that it, the value will bounce back, that it will rebound. In other words, you're holding it again for future value, not for present value, right? Yeah, and you couldn't escape with it. Like you, it would be very difficult to carry all of your gold bricks away if you were under a. Yeah. You, you said apocalypse. I'll say zombie apocalypse attack. Yeah. Um, Pockets I, full I, of I gold. Or, have, it's a great band yeah, name. It would but weigh it, you down. Sam, or, did you have or tartar sauce? Sam, <laughs> I'm going to be known for the tartar sauce now. You, you <laughs> are you. What's your take on Bitcoin, Sam? Uh, actually, there wasn't a take on Bitcoin. It was just a take on things with intrinsic value. Because, like, I've often done that apocalypse scenario, and in, like in my mind. You know, the thing that you'll want to be hoarding is like fresh water. Like that would be the right. most valuable thing on planet Earth. Totally. Would you say? Totally. Like a 20 liter thing of water would be worth more than than a brick of gold in the right circumstance. I mean, you talk to somebody making their way across the Sahara. What would they rather have a brick of gold or a thing? Anyway, we're like now we're getting really esoteric. Um, this is what you know, uh, it's Friday. This is what happens, pal. Let, let me ask you this in closing. I like it. Because this caught my attention. I thought this was really interesting. Russell Okong, he's a, a, a star with the uh, Carolina Panthers uh, National Football League. Now, he's not technically. They're saying he's the first NFL player to be paid in Bitcoin. Uh, the NFL and the Carolina Panthers have clarified. They said technically he is paid in U.S. dollars like every other athlete. However, immediately half of his salary i think it's like 13 million a year or something his salary just incredible half of it he's taking in bitcoin now 
that could be a seven and a half million dollar annual purchase that explodes or he could lose it all. Obviously, uh, do you think or do you foresee more and more? I mean, you even said there's the there's a matching incentive for your employees right now on a on a smaller scale. I don't think you're paying anyone yeah. 13 million a year, um, but <laughs> not do, yet. Do you think that this is going to be more the norm? What do you make of that story? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely brilliant. I think that um, Bitcoin incentivizes saving and and our money right now, our money is less valuable this morning than it was yesterday morning because the purchasing power has gone down because when we were sleeping, the money printer was printing and that makes our money less, less valuable. And so um, Bitcoin, when you spend Bitcoin to buy a car, for example, or, or anything, um, in five years, that Bitcoin could and probably will be worth a lot more than what you spent it on. A perfect example is me, myself, when Bitcoin hit five grand, I went out and bought, bought a car and that car is now, uh, you know, has now cost me 10 times more than the sticker price. I have the most expensive, you know, of this car in the world because, uh, Bitcoin is now worth 50 grand. And when I sold it at five grand to buy this nice car, which I'm very happy about, blah, 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 um, it's a know, Tesla, right? I Are we talking do... about the right? Can you tell us what car it is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a Tesla. So, so I went out and bought this Tesla and, and now it has cost me 10 times more. If I would have held the Bitcoin, I could have bought 10 Teslas today. Um, and so Bitcoin incentivizes saving in that way. And yeah. I think that, um, you know, our, our existing money incentivizes borrowing incentivizes, uh, spending irrationally or impulsively. And, um, I don't think that that's a good mindset to be in. Adam, I always, I, this is like, it's like whenever we golf, it's no offense to the other two in the foursome, but I always want to share a cart with you. Cause I love these types of conversations. <laughs> I love the way your mind works. Um, not everybody agrees with you. That's the beauty of it. And I know you love convincing people. I know you love talking to people. People can find you and your team at Bitcoin. Well, we appreciate your sponsorship on the show. Have a wonderful weekend, my man. Thanks so much. And I see uh, Carmen in the chat there. And I yeah. want to say a uh, quick hello to to Carmen, who we work with Carmen. And that's been awesome. Oh, do you? Well, you, you're uh, your you're pals. Yeah, Carmen's going to be joining. We're talking uh, next 30, next 30 years in Alberta. Do you, do you have a fastball question for Carmen? Ooh, Carmen, what's your favorite thing about being on the board of directors at Bitcoin Well? <laughs> oh, is he on the board of directors? Oh, my. OK, small world. I didn't even know that. OK, Adam, thanks, buddy. Have a good weekend. Um, that's okay, uh, that's Adam O'Brien. Uh, uh, he is uh, obviously the founder and CEO of Bitcoin Well. Um, you know who else is big into Bitcoin? I'm not sure. This is this has nothing to do with what they're about. Uh, but the team at Kubi Energy, uh, these are guys also. And, and I hate saying think outside the box because it's. When you say in 2021, you, when you say thinking outside the box, you are not thinking outside the box. So let me just say they are unconventional and ambitious and fearless thinkers. I love how they've built Kubi Energy, uh, Western Canada's uh, biggest uh, installer of solar. They're Tesla certified and they've got certified electricians doing all the installs, whether it's a smaller gig like, like your bungalow or whether it's the Edmonton Convention Center. Uh, these guys have Western Canada covered. Um, they've got Tesla power walls, EV chargers, electronic vehicle chargers. If you're looking into getting into the Tesla game, for example, you want to have that charger installed into your garage. They, they do all kinds of cool stuff. And you can find them online at kubienergy.ca. That's K-U-B-Y energy.ca. Of course, they sponsor Positive Reflections. That's coming up on Monday. If something made your day, tell us the story to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We want to hear it. The team at Dairy Queen wants to see you, and you have been showing up on mass. I love this at the six locations in North Edmonton and Sherwood Park, uh, Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. They told us that they've been overrun with people in the drive throughs rolling in just saying, we are real talkers and we are here for the two for one. I love it. So until further notice, right now, they're doing boxes of six dilly bars buy one get one free if you tell them you're a real talker only at those six locations and they have dairy free dilly bars as well how great is that the team at st albert and sherwood dodge really excited about 2021 it's a big year for the jeep lineup and they are your go-to jeep dealers in the province of alberta they've got that new seven passenger grand cherokee coming pretty soon they say the grand wagoneer as well which is going to ramp up the luxury game they're going toe to toe against the escalade uh they've got a wide selection though of every jeep model from the capable and fuel efficient compass all the way up to those jacked up gladiators and the big wranglers you can find them at st albert and sherwood dodge sam let's take a look at what's making news headlines today everybody's talking about this three and a half million dollar alberta government public inquiry into this alleged uh, foreign-funded anti-energy campaigns. Well, uh, 
the word is out and uh, people are outraged at what the money's being spent on under uh, Steve Allen. It turns out that he's been inviting people like like climate science deniers to present papers to the Alberta government. And in exchange, they're getting paid between twenty eight and fifty thousand dollars like this report out of Barry Cooper, uh, who wrote that, quote, um, I mean, this is just unbelievable. The growing scientific skepticism regarding the so-called consensus view regarding climate change. I mean, these are the types of paper. This is what your money's going toward, Alberta. What do you think this is doing to international investment when the government is paying for papers denying the reality of climate change as part of some conspiracy theory tinfoil hat mandate? Because if it's not that, it's just a way to put money in the pockets of friends of the politicians. It's one or the other. We're going to be talking to a couple individuals that are doing a deep dive on this inquiry. The inquiry is getting an inquiry because the public is demanding it. We're doing that on Monday. Maligned MLA Pat Rain out of Lesser Slave Lake speaking to his constituents last night by way of Facebook says he was informed of his expulsion from the United Conservative Party. And get this, he says he's relieved, but he's not resigning. He says there are advantages of not being tied to a party. He'll now be able to express his opinion of lockdown measures. He says there's also large projects in the work that he's proud to be a part of. So the guy that didn't show up when he was a government MLA and had the premier calling him, Jason Kenney yesterday saying Pat Rain wouldn't answer his calls, now says he's going to do a better job now that he has zero accountability. You want to put up the expense claims really quick, just just to get a sense of what you're dealing with. And this isn't just Pat, but his expense claims came out the other day, four straight months, every day of the month for four straight months, every day he billed Alberta taxpayers the maximum amount. I know that there's a lot of black and white and gobbledy, it's a little, but, but that's the point. Expense forms aren't sexy, but look at this, $41 and change every single day. $41 and change for his food stipend every single day. You go, well, why $41? Because that's the exact amount to the cent that you're allowed to bill, that MLAs are allowed to bill taxpayers for food allowances without providing receipts. So for four straight months, every day of those four straight months, he was in Edmonton, not Lesser Slave Lake, billing taxpayers for the maximum allowable food without a receipt. And you wonder why people are, you know, sting, didn't sting, saying people are losing their faith in the politicians. Stuff like that. And stateside yesterday, we saw Donald Trump become the first sitting U.S. president to become impeached twice. Uh, This time, the vote drawing bipartisan support, including 10 Republican members of the House of Representatives, uh, impeaching Trump on a single charge of incitement of insurrection. This is a contrast, obviously, to the first time that Trump was impeached. Listen to what we're saying. The first time he was impeached in December of 2019 over the Ukraine scandal when the Republicans supported him en masse. Well, it brought out a prominent American evangelist who is going to the wall in his support of Donald Trump. As Billy rolls over in his grave, his son Franklin tweets, shame, shame on the 10 Republicans who joined with Pelosi and the Dems in impeaching President Trump after all he has done for our country. You would turn your back and betray him so quickly. What was done yesterday only further divides our nation. That's Franklin Graham, everybody. Find somewhere else to send your charity dollars next Christmas. That's the news. Now let's get to this next panel. I'm really excited to check in with these three. You may have been hearing about the next 30 at the next 30.ca. And and before we even get started, I want to thank our panelists for their patience as we've run into overtime and let our consciousness stream. Uh, These three are here with us right through until 10 o'clock as we talk about this new project and the possibility panel is what is where you come in, Alberta. Uh, Chad Park is the co-chair of the possibility panel. He was the founding director of the energy futures lab, uh, Uh, He believes that polarization is a hindering progress, uh, is hindering progress in our province. We need to think big about our place in the world. Chad, thanks for joining us. We're thrilled to have you here, my man. Great to be here. Thanks, Ryan. Carmen McNary uh, joining you as well. We've just heard he's on the board at Bitcoin Well. We'll have to ask him about that a little bit, but I know he's here to talk about bigger stuff. Uh, Past chair of the Alberta Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Edmonton Community Foundation. Carmen and I worked together when he was the campaign co-chair back in 2017 for the United Way campaign. He's a lawyer and part of this possibility panel. Carmen, welcome to the show. We're happy to have you here. 
Thank you very much for having me on, Ryan. Uh, really excited to be here. I'm a regular viewer, as you know. Well, thank you very much. And Salima Kassam is rounding out our panel, Executive Director at Sunrise Community Resource Center, also the board chair at Downstage Theater, um, calling Calgary home after living in Vancouver for quite some time. Salima, welcome to the show. I guess I should ask you, why Alberta? Why don't we start there? What a, what a perfect jumping off point. Uh, Vancouver is a pretty wonderful place to live. What was it about Calgary that captured your heart? Why Alberta? It was actually uh, my father. Uh, he brought us to Calgary because he wanted to pursue his dream of being his own boss and running his own company. Uh, so, of course, where else would you go but Alberta to be an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, it was 1989 when we first uh, moved here. And it wasn't a great time to start a business in Alberta. So it didn't go very well. Um, but uh, but. It's been home ever since. What do you think it is about? I mean, you know, we, we talk about the Alberta entrepreneurial spirit. We talk about how Albertans are wired. And I do think that that's a thing. Um, what do you think it is, Salima? What do, what, what do you think it is? I mean, are you able to put it into words? I think it's the idea of being my own boss. For, for, for my father anyway, and for what I see from a lot of people, it's that idea of I'm in charge of my destiny. And, uh, and I want to be the one to drive my destiny. Mm-hmm. I get that. Chad, why don't we, for, for people that aren't familiar now, of course, people can check out the next 30.ca. Uh, I know, I know you launched it a while back and, and it's, it's gleaned all kinds of questions, which is good. Um, I saw even when we announced last night that you three were going to be on the show, the first comment was, is this going to be a political party? And if not, what's the point? So what is the next 30 and what's your goal? What's it all about? And how are you going to get there? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, I'll answer that question directly in a moment, but uh, what it is is a, is a few things. First of all, it's a not-for-profit organization that we created uh, a few months ago. And uh, it's also a platform for engaging citizens in conversation about the future of Alberta and wanted to create a, a way to do that that uh, elicits dialogue from lots of different uh, points of view and that, um, and that really creates a platform for people to share ideas about the future. Our, you know, our thinking is that there are some really big challenges the province is facing. There's some there's some need for some boldness and some creative thinking about our place in the future. And um, and we didn't see a lot of um, a lot of place for dialogue like that in the province. And so created this not for profit organization to um, to create some ways for for citizens to engage that way. Um, in terms of the question about if it's going to be a political party, the short answer is no. Uh, and um, I, I, I will say, you know, we're facing these challenges. We've, uh, we've, we need some, some creative ideas in the province. And I think our hypothesis or our, you know, part of this experiment is that the creating the next 30 will create some ways to surface those ideas that can't really happen through partisan politics. And, um, and we'll see if that happens as we as we get into these next few weeks of sessions with uh, the possibility panel, which I know we're going to talk about. Um, and and then if if uh, existing political parties take on those ideas uh, and help advance them and implement them, that'll be great. And uh, but the other point is that it's not just about policy. Um, you know, other organizations can can potentially take on some of the ideas that are surfaced here on a community scale or in organ- other kinds of organizations as well. Carmen, so, if, if I know, sorry, Chad, did I step on your toes there? Let me finish your that's thought. That's right. Go ahead. No, uh, that's okay. Go Carmen, ahead. I know uh, I, I've seen you as a man about town. And I've seen your involvement. I know that you're anything but lazy. So I would imagine that you probably, uh, when considering new involvements, uh, when considering where you're going to channel your efforts and your energy, it's got to be something that resonates with you. It's got to be something that means something to you personally. So what brought you to this point? Did, did you identify a deficit in leadership? Are you, are you unhappy with the direction politics is going? Uh, why are you here? I guess I'd start by saying I, I'm here in terms of the potential that this, frank, frankly, an experiment uh, brings to the table. I mean, you, you mentioned some of the organizations that I've been involved with around Alberta and Edmonton and our community uh, for a long time. Um, and I have learned along the way that people uh, confuse possibility, policy, and politics uh, too often. Um, so my starting point in this was that uh, the group uh, that had been brought together was creating an, o- an opportunity to, to broaden the, the conversation in a positive way, looking at it 
not just from challenges, but but from what is possible in Alberta. And that, that really attracted me. Uh, the second thing is uh, they were doing so in an open invitation to, to frankly, all Albertans of all political stripes uh, to join the conversation. And, and one of my favorite business leaders uh, that I've heard in a room uh, often starts and, and repeats over the course of his discussions that the smartest person in this room is the room. Uh, we are better when we get together. We are better when we listen to each other. We are better when we're open to other people's ideas. Uh, and this uh, process uh, that Next30 and the, and the people that had the vision to put this together like Chad uh, created was that I could be part of a conversation with a whole lot of people that I otherwise might not ever have an opportunity to meet. And that's already been realized in the introductory sessions. Uh, they're using technology in a way that I don't know that any political party or uh, think tank is doing to get people together in small groups with breakout rooms. And I've already met people from around the province that have completely different perspectives than I do. Uh, and that was exciting. So the, this idea is the idea of focusing on the possibilities and on the, on the policies at a community level, at a, at a municipal level, at a, at a provincial level, even at a federal level are things that I think are worthy of exploring. And then the last, piece that uh, I really like about this and and I hope it can be exciting because it it doesn't sound exciting uh, is that the possibilities are really complex and the discourse on social media and political parties is almost always binary you know uh, I could give you example after example of complex issues that it's either you're on board or you're not well, and the real answer we all know is going to be some more some more nuanced version of that, and I think we need to to focus on that. The last me, thing I'm going Carmen, on, Carmen, what long, I always do, I always do. Just show, hold on a second, yeah. Ryan. I got one point I want to make. Okay. Somebody sent a note last night after the email uh, announcing this. Claire Kratz sent an email to to you and me and and uh, to Next Thirty saying the possibility will come from listening to science and uplifting youth voices. It is their future. We need to listen. Um, that's the other thing that attracts me to this process is that I actually agree with that. I uh, strongly agree with that uh, statement. Uh, you had on a, an incredibly articulate grade six uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and listening to her, I was able to learn something. And it's that broadening of the conversation. I think that this is just an experiment. We'll see if it works. Let me ask you in, in, in circling back, you, and I, I want to put you on the spot. You, you said you could think of any number of complex issues that are presented in binary fashion where either you're on board or you're not. I have a few in my mind right as soon as you said that. The first one I thought about was harm reduction, supervised consumption, uh, decriminalizing or legalizing narcotics, safe supply. Um, what would be an example that would immediately come to mind for you? Uh, that's a great example, by the way. I, heard, I listened to your, your brother from Vancouver. I listened to your interview with the politician uh, talking about it. It is a great example where... Uh, not only are the answers not binary, you've got to be really careful about the uh, taking a dogmatic or ideological approach to what is a complex social issue. And we see that in Edmonton, it was about poverty reduction, uh, a poverty elimination, really ambitious goal. We were told for, by many people all the way along that it was not possible and simply don't go there. Uh, in fact, one journal columnist who's now a senator and has been on this show uh threw stones at the, at the mayor for even opening the conversation and said that it, 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 because you can't solve the problem, you will fail and that will lead to cynicism. She was wrong then. I think she probably knows that now. Uh, but that's a, that's a great example. The other one that in, in Alberta politics that I would say is people ask the question, should Alberta have a sales tax? And the answer is either yes or no. And, and that's also wrong. Uh, the answer is Alberta needs a stable fiscal platform, uh, which is one of the things that is on our possibility list. Um, and that may or may not probably does include a sales tax, uh, but it's not a yes or no answer. I, Chad, I want to ask you to talk about the possibility panel in just a second. But Salima, I want to I want to ask you the exact same question uh, that I did to Carmen. I mean, I'm, I'm taking a look here just even at your CV and you're you're involved in Arts Commons and the Cornerstone Youth Centers and all these you have all these in, these things that are pulling at you. 
Um, so I would imagine that, you know, a little downtime is, is appealing as well, but, but here you are, you're contributing your time and your efforts and your involvement to this. Is it because you've identified something that you, you find to be unacceptable in, in politics? Is there a deficit in leadership? Are you concerned about the direction the province is going in? Did you just want to be a part to be a part? What drew you into this? So yes to all of those, uh, okay. those com- those questions that you just asked in terms of where we're at right now in Alberta. I'm worried. I think a lot of people are worried. Um, and a lot of people want to see something different. But mainly for me, it was about the fact that they asked me to come on uh, as someone to listen. And so the possibility panelists, the people who, who have become possibility panelists, our job is to listen and to actually hear from um, a great plurality of Albertans. And that's the hope is that we'll be hearing from, from people that we've never talked to before, connected with people we haven't never connected with before. And I really like that idea. I'm very... Um, aware of the fact that most of what I do happens in an echo chamber and, and that most of the thinking that I, I undertake happens with people who think the same way that I do, who have very similar backgrounds and education to, to myself. And so for to have this opportunity to actually listen um, on a wider scale to people from all parts of the province and to have that role as listener, I think was really appealing to me because I, I, I don't like to I don't like to hear the sound of my voice that much. I like to hear other people talk. Um, Chad, I want to, you know, we call the show Real Talk. We keep it real. And that means that sometimes with guests, I want to throw a fastball. And uh, it's because our audience has a voice. And it's important that our audience has a voice. So here's one. Here's one coming high and inside. Uh, Dylan is on the pitcher's mound. And Dylan says, it just seems to me like a group of wealthy, privileged people who got together to make a pretty brand. What would you say to Dylan? Um, well, thank you for the compliment on the brand, first of all. Um, but uh, more seriously, I think um, I think if you look hard at at the profiles of the people who are involved in the possibility panel, you'll see that they come from a pretty diverse set of backgrounds. And I think there's always um, we we had some feedback on that when when we launched back in November that there were gaps there, and uh, we took that feedback to heart, and we are going to be um, adding some some more people um, to the panel over the next couple of weeks um, based on that feedback. So, um, I I can I can appreciate that, um, but I think the the really important point here is that the panel, just what um, Salima just said, the the panel's job is primarily to listen to Albertans. So, um, we're We'll talk about the process, I, I'm sure, but the the intention here is actually to hear the ideas of people who want to come out and share their ideas. Um, and so, you know, these these panelists all have their own ideas as well. Uh, I think more significantly, they have reached to different communities throughout the province. Um, and it was with that in mind, but also with um, the intention to find people who have an interest in connecting with people from different backgrounds and into listening to and synthesizing ideas from others. So you want, but you uh, want like someone like Dylan that said that, and I don't know Dylan's, I don't know anything about Dylan. Um, but, but he's, he's, he's on the chat. Uh, there's an interesting conversation going, you guys can watch it later. If you want to check out the YouTube, we post it and you'll be able to see how the conversation was unfolding while you were talking. And, and some people are, are sort of, you know, they're going head to head with Dylan here, but everyone's keeping it civil, which is good. Uh, I always feel like I'm kind of snooping in and keeping an eye on the chat, making sure everybody plays nice. But Dylan's made a several com- several comments about wealth and equity, and which leads me to believe I may be making an assumption. Maybe that'll make an ass out of uh, out of you and me. But but maybe Dylan is a low, lower income earner, and maybe Dylan feels like people don't have lower income earners' backs, and maybe lower income earners feel underrepresented. Which is maybe where the possibility panel and the town halls and the mandate and everything you're getting set to roll out comes into play so before we get uh, the, the panel's take on this chad how does this all work out i mean how do people like dylan have a say in the next 30 years in alberta great question and that is exactly the point point. and I, I would like salima to to weigh in on that because i know this is her field of work um so um but uh yeah to answer your question that's exactly it um we'd love for dylan to come to these sessions um they're designed in such a way that uh, that um, it's really about harvesting the ideas that that um, that people like Dylan have on the different topics here, and um, and so if you know if if we can if there are better ways for us to help enable 
uh, and create a platform for people's voice to be elevated, we are open to those suggestions and we've created this one platform, but that's exactly the point of it. So do you want to take it? Why don't we just hand it over to you? Uh, sure. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's really important to be intentional about who who we're making sure that we're reaching out to. So, for example, um, I do have connections to, to I work in, in, with lower income people and, and people who are living in poverty in Calgary um, every day. Uh, and, and we're happy to bring bring that, those that community of people into this conversation, but it takes a little bit of extra intention. And I think that that's also something that having this, this great group of people, the organizers and the possibility panelists, having this huge group of people being willing to, to do that intentional work, uh, helping people access some technology, uh, setting people up for the conversation, making sure that they feel comfortable joining and entering the conversation, even walking with them through the conversation uh, during when we're having our panel sessions um, and our conversation sessions. So all of that is, is is very important to be able to actually, again, go out and get uh, different voices into these conversations and hear from people who, who, who are angry, who are frustrated, but also who are hopeful um, and who want to see a, a different reality for both for themselves individually and for all of us in, in Alberta. And one of the things that, um, you know, I, I, in my work that I always try to remember is that our job is to believe in people. And so um, let's invite, and let's bring into the conversation and then let's just believe uh, that again, the people in the room will have the answers. Uh, um, doing, yeah. Carry on. Can, can I, can I just weigh in a, a little bit on this? So first of all, I'd say uh, at this point in my life, there is no question. I am a person with privilege. There, 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 there's just no, no way around that. Uh, and I'm not ashamed of it either. Uh, but I was reminded by a young uh, member of our firm in Toronto, person of color, uh, that one of the ways to deal with the whole privilege issue and the movement that is going on across all Western societies about that is to actually share the privilege. Uh, and, and in part, by coming to the table and listening and learning from it and using whatever influence I can bring, whether it's, as Chad said, attracting my network and getting more people engaged uh, or just listening, as Salima said, uh that's that's an active part of of this whole process and it's it's why i came to the table so uh that would be my first response and my second would be to dylan please join us come, come go on it's free uh you have the computer because you're you're watching this show uh so join it and contribute your ideas and support the ideas of others that are aligned with what you think should be happening we don't actually know uh, what we're going to be uh, developing out of all of this because we haven't had the opportunity to get people together, to have the conversation, to create to, to create the list of ideas and to get the support of the room for the best ideas and the most important ideas. And Dylan can be part of that. And everybody else that has a computer and can watch your show can be part of it. So, you know, next next week we kick off with the economic diversification. That won't be the topic that is most interesting to some people. Uh, but there will be other other uh, sessions to come, and and there will be opportunities if you have an idea, contribute the idea. So I'm I'm looking at the next thirty dot ca. People can check it out themselves, and and you know you're going to be releasing a schedule. Uh, people can explore different themes. There's really and I want to get to this in a second. Like the provincial budget, that's a big one. Boring but it affects everybody, right? Truth, reconciliation, and indigenous opportunity, health and wellness, talent. How do we attract it? How do re we retain it? In other words, how do we keep it? How do we prevent a brain drain, right? Social fabric, energy and climate, economic diversification, like Carmen just mentioned at the next30.ca. Back with our panelists in just a second. Wanted to remind you, uh, real talkers, if you've got plumbing and heating work that needs to be done, I know it's basically felt like August, through most of the winter here in the province of Alberta and across Western Canada. We've had a relatively mild one, relatively speaking, but you know how it's going to go with your furnace. It'll wait to conk out until it's minus 30. Call Todd's Mechanical. Even if you don't need him today, write down the number or punch it into your phone so you have it when you need him. He's a plumber that's keeping Edmonton warm and dry. This guy's grassroots, small business. This guy's the real deal. Uh, takes care of wants to take care of your plumbing and heating needs uh, also furnace repairs as mentioned uh, for the best plumbers in Edmonton and don't take my word for it don't even take Todd's word for it check out his online reviews they are bulletproof call Todd's Mechanical 
That's 780-499-7598. That's 780-499-7598. A proud partner of Real Talk is Todd's Mechanical. Friesen Brothers is under 60 days until they open up their Rabbit Hill store here in Edmonton. It'll be their 15th store in Alberta. And for more than 60 years, they've been proud to be a part of the fabric of this community. 14 different stores across Alberta right now carrying only Alberta beef, pork, chicken, and turkey. They also use Alberta milled flour in their bakeries and support as many Alberta farmers as they can in their produce departments. They've got the Red Seal chefs, the real butchers and bakers. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. We're grateful for their support. So let's get to this. There's a lot that this Next 30 panel is looking to tackle with the possibility panels. They want your involvement at the next30.ca. Uh, I want to put our three panelists uh, on the spot a little bit. I mean, Salima, when, when we take a look at the Next 30 and what that looks like, not everybody's going to have an opinion on the budget or not everybody's going to have an opinion on energy and climate or talent. You personally when you take a look at the future of the province you call home, the province you love, you take a look at why you're involved, what motivates you here. What's one area of focus that you in particular are especially eager to influence? Okay, so as much as, yeah, I would like to listen, I do have opinions. <laughs> and definitely, um, uh, if I were to influence things, it would be about changing um, our the narrative that we're holding around um, social issues and social problems, including, uh, you know, how we distribute wealth uh, in our province and, and what it means to have the types of policies that we have right now. And what is the real cost of the types of policies that we have right now? And the fact that we're not reducing poverty, we're not getting anywhere, and we're not um, able to actually change the rate of of health outcomes and crime outcomes and, and, and other different core outcomes that we have in this province when it comes to issues of, of social of social well-being. Um, we're failing in many ways to offer a proper quality of life uh, to a lot of people. And that's that's a huge issue. And I'd like I'd like to get uh, to a different place on the narrative though. I think that we have a lot of a lot of challenges in the way that we're approaching these conversations. We have a lot of challenges in the way that we're shaping these narratives. Um, and that we need to get to a new place. We need to get to an unknown place in these narratives. Perhaps that is about actually thinking about guaranteed annual income, but perhaps there's something even more. Maybe there's, there's things that are even beyond the horizon. And I don't think we're asking the right questions to get to that place beyond the horizon. Uh, Kim, uh, Chad, let me put this in front of you. Kim is watching. She says, isn't the group's intention to just create conversation amongst each other? I'm not seeing a mandated outcome. Um, let me almost rephrase or let me add to Kim's question. I mean, there's, there's really no impetus for any party to listen to you or to consider your findings. I mean, quite frankly, let me say the words, uh, this government in Alberta provincially is demonstrating that it doesn't really give a rip what anybody thinks. As a matter of fact, across the board, the one thing that they're demonstrating consistency on is their lack of consultation. Uh, so ultimately, uh, really, you could come up with something that goes nowhere. How do you prevent that? How do you make sure that doesn't happen? Yeah, we could we could do that. That's for sure. Um, I think the and, and we can't guarantee that that won't happen. Um, but I think the things we're trying to put in place to help uh help prevent against that are are really about who's engaged and who's involved. Um, so there is some value, I think, that we we see in the dialogue and the discussion in the way that it's being framed and the, um, the possibility of, of engaging multiple people and different people. Um, but uh, I th as I think that question is servicing, that's not an end in itself. That is more of a, of a means uh, to, to some other outcome. And so if you think about um, Ryan, the example of the Fair Deal panel, um, another another entity that had the word panel in its headline. Um, the you know they went across the province and they listened to Albertans, where the question was, how can Alberta get a get a fair deal from the rest of Canada, and um, and heard a bunch of ideas and then put out a uh, uh, you know a paper that um, in that case it was specifically, of course, commissioned by the government and. And it was positioned as advice to the government. Um, but I guess the idea there, or the point I'm making, the parallel I'm making is that um, ideas were put forward and now there's an opportunity for actors to decide if they want to, and, and citizens to decide if they want to um, act on it and pursue some of those ideas. Um, we actually 
I, I draw the parallel partly because um, it, it actually informs kind of how this whole idea got started, um, where we we felt like the Fair Deal panel was asking the wrong questions about the future of Alberta. Um, and we we're kind of frustrated by that. And, and so if you ask a question like, how can Alberta get a fair deal from the rest of Canada, you're going to get a certain type of answer and you're going to get a certain type of engagement. So uh, we just wanted to pose some different questions to Alberta uh, that are more about the future, more about possibility. So what's possible for the future of Alberta? And, and we think we're going to get different kinds of answers. But the, an the, the ideas that are generated, you know, we, we haven't decided yet on what form they will be pulled together, but we will ultimately synthesize them into some kind of an output. Um, and, and like was said earlier, that some of those ideas may be the kinds of ideas that would ideally be enacted by government, uh, but, but it doesn't have to be limited to, to that. It, it could be ideas that communities of people can act on. It could be ideas that individual organizations can act on and so on. So um, we're kind of leaving open what will happen once we get to that point um, to sort of really stay open to um, it really depends on what the ideas are that are that are generated here and and both what solutions they're they're seeking to advance but also which parties are implied as relevant depending on what the ideas are i'd like to i'd like to update you all on a on a real development a real time development on real talk uh dylan had questions uh, suggesting this was just a bunch of rich people getting together and hearing each other talk he says i didn't expect my comment to actually get addressed that's what makes this show great thank you to the panel for answering i'm glad to hear the group is willing to take criticism and i've now signed up to participate so dylan's going to be involved with the next 30 which is pretty awesome um uh, carmen this is this may be almost I, I don't mean to like circle back and ask the same question of you that i just asked to chad but but uh sandra azakar is watching this morning which i really appreciate uh from friends of medicare and she says, a question for your possibility panel. Carmen, I'll put it to you. Uh, she says, once you've identified possibilities and ideas, how do you impact change? Now, I might have my own answer here because I think that even this exercise alone is going to bring people together. It's going to connect people. It's actually probably going to have a ton of spin-off benefit that may be outside the parameters of the next 30. But but what would you say to Sandra, who's watching live right now? Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. And it's, uh, it's what I addressed when I talked earlier about this being a bit of an experiment yeah uh the types of outcomes that the possibility sort of menu uh has opened up for us um is a way to mobilize a different group in a completely different way it actually fed into the i think it's being fed by the covid uh shift to this sort of virtual platform like what we're doing this morning and reaching so many people so quickly uh, where we can efficiently consult across the province and people can sign up from high level to, to Lethbridge to, to West and East uh, of all ages, of all experience uh, backgrounds, uh, of all economic uh, parameters that, that, that affect them. And we can gather those ideas to affect the change that should come from the best of the ideas and not every idea will be will will have equal impact we are going to need a couple of things the first is we need to persuade people in the public we need as many people involved in this as we can possibly get and we need them to become ambassadors for great ideas and so if we come up with a uh a recommendation around uh health care uh and the delivery of, of health care in the province that's that is aligned to what friends of Medicare might might advance, then they become an ally. If we develop an idea around small business and diversification and support to to ex uh, exciting new business ventures, uh, the Alberta Chamber of Commerce might become on board and they become an ally. If we develop an idea that resonates with a minister in a particular department, he or she might might actually implemented. I've seen that happen, actually, not with this government and not with the previous one. But but back in the day, we, we made some pitches up that were fairly far out there. And we're surprised to see how quickly good ideas get taken up. Uh, and then the last piece is to the point that Chad made earlier, at the end of the day, uh, and this is a personal opinion, it's not, uh, I'm not speaking for next 30 right now. Uh, 
we think that it's amazing to me having been born and raised in this province and everybody talks about the entrepreneurial spirit and the free enterprise sort of model and the cowboys i mean our whole culture it is amazing to me the degree to which everybody expects government to solve all these problems uh at the end of the day people solve the problems uh we can if we can change the behavior in some businesses if we can change the behavior uh, in some organizations, if we can engage and get people moving in the same direction, the politicians will eventually follow. Uh, I saw Ralph Klein one time uh, describe it. I thought it was the most one of the most appalling statements I, I'd heard from a politician a long time ago. And he, he was uh, on stage about to introduce, as part of the introduction for Rudy Giuliani, actually, amazingly enough. Um, and Giuliani was going to talk about leadership. And uh, Klein got up on stage and said, you know, I'm not an academic. I haven't studied this a whole bunch, but I've been in positions for a long time. My view of leadership is figure out which way the parade is going and get in front of it. Oh. Um, and I mean, just think about that from a whole bunch of perspectives. But the truth of the matter is, if the parade gets moving, if we can be part of mobilizing the community, politicians will get in front of it. I have a I have an example to share of that, Ryan, um, if I can. Yeah. The the um, the work I did uh, previously as director of the Energy Futures Lab is a uh, is an example of this where it's, uh, you know, not as broad as what we're talking about here, but it's still a pretty broad issue about uh, energy transition, you know, the, the kind of polarization that exists on energy issues between um, energy sector goals and climate goals and, and, and so on. Um, and more than five years ago, that initiative was created with the idea that we, you know, need to try to find some common ground on these issues among different stakeholders. And um, I won't describe the whole thing, but that, that process, ultimately, it was experimental as well. It, um, you know, it, it, it took some time to build the relationships and the trust and, and so on. But ultimately, it yielded. Uh, it either yielded or amplified uh, a, a wide range of initiatives for Alberta that are, I, I, I am sure, are going to be part of our energy future. Things like the hydrogen economy, um, bitumen uses for bitumen beyond combustion. Um, you know, alternative use, uh, alternative uses for uh, abandoned oil wells, et cetera, et cetera, and. Um, those were found because people were talking to people they don't usually talk to, or because they were uh, they were they were engaging with people who they who might not always agree with them. And I don't think we find the best solutions when we're talking to people we already agree with, usually. Um, so the, the the end of the story is that now several of those ideas that have been nurtured over the years in the Energy Futures Lab are both being enacted by this government. If you look at the hydrogen economy, um, some of their work on, on, on metals, uh, lithium, for example, and so on, uh, and are also part of the NDP's um, uh, framing around the issues and um, their, their efforts to engage on, on future, like on hydrogen and so on too. So there's an example of what Carmen's talking about. The, you, know, you get the right ideas at the right time and you nurture it and you, and you build some momentum around it among stakeholders and citizens. And then, um, and then good things can happen. Salima, I know that, uh, and I want to let you explain it. I don't want to have, I don't have to tee it up for you, but I know that education is a big part of your focus, um, and I know that's an area that you're really interested in impacting. I wanted to read this from Nancy. Uh, Nancy's watching this morning on YouTube. She says, "You know, uh, parents of neurodiverse kids need a seat at the table." Uh, she says education is a huge piece of the pie when it comes to our budget. Uh, we need real talk about the issues facing education, but who on this panel even knows about it? Uh, she goes on to say, you know, one of the, one of the issues here, uh, realistically speaking, is she says kids with disabilities just just well, let me use my words. They're not. She says the issue is not sexy. It's not splashed across everybody's radar. There's things everybody else is talking about. But in the meantime, whether you're talking about losing puff funding or something else, uh, these families are, are impacted in a very real way. What would you say to her? So it's a it's a it's a topic that is very close to my heart, um, and uh, and she's absolutely right. Uh, we need far better supports for neuro neurodiverse children and adults all across. Uh, 
our healthcare system and our education system. There's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done to bring us up to par with countries in the world that are doing much better work. Um, and so absolutely, um, I think that is, please come to the table and bring that perspective to the table and allow us all to, to try and push for these solutions together because it's we're, we won't be able to get anywhere alone, right? Um, and so I, you know, just even right now, I'm just like, oh wow, well, I'd love to, I'd love to further this conversation and talk to Nancy about um, some of the initiatives and, and businesses that um, I know of that are starting up actually here in Calgary to actually work on on building you know, like better options for for children with uh, with neurodiversity challenges. Anyway, um, so absolutely, I think that uh, all of these, all of these, everyone has something that is requiring some change because right now is a moment of change, um, right? The, the, the quote from, uh, from the great writer, uh, I'm gonna say her name wrong, but Adru Hendi Roy, right? The pandemic is a portal. So everyone is looking for this time to be able to be something that will take us into a better future for, for everyone who's around us. And let's, let's do that. I hope that this is an opportunity to do that. And I think that uh, come and join us and, and, and help us do that. Look, very humbly, we don't, we're a group of people who, who just wanna do that too. We don't know all of the answers. We don't know all of the challenges that, every, that, you know, that are facing Alberta. And so we need you. Um, so the possibility panel here, I want to, you know, obviously we want to have a call to action. In my mind, every interview uh, wraps or includes a call to action. So what the hell are we supposed to do about this? Well, you go to the next 30.ca coming up on Wednesday, January 20th at seven o'clock. Uh, possibility panel launches. It's the first one on economic diversification. Uh, a week after that, a week and a bit, on Thursday the 28th, uh, we'll be talking about inclusive social fabric. On Thursday, February 4th, they'll be talking about energy and climate. That's going to be... I mean, I'm a big fan of Ed Whalen, a ring a ding dong dandy. That's going to be, I'm sure. Uh, but Wednesday, you can register at the next 30.ca. I want to ask each of you, I want to give you a chance to wrap, to close. You know, if there's anything I know after years and years of conducting interviews, every single person while walking out of the room when we used to be able to do this in studio would say, oh, I should have mentioned da da da. And then you go, wow, that was perfect. Why didn't we get to that? So I'd like to allow people to have a chance to make a closing argument. So, Carmen, uh, you just looked up like you're deep in thought right now. I hope, but if I know you, you think on your feet, because uh, I'm going to put you in the spotlight first, my man. Uh, give us something to walk with. Give us something to chew on today. So, the first call to action is to join in, uh, and we've already talked about that. Whether, and I'm glad that Dylan's going to going to join us. I, I hope I hope that I get in the uh, breakout room with him so that I can get to know him a little bit better. Uh, but the second call to action would actually be. Uh, be thoughtful about this. Don't think about the binary answers or the, the dogmatic or ideological answers that are already out there. Uh, if you look at each of the possibilities, they're broad topics uh, that require some real thought. And I, I'm hoping that people that are willing to take the time and sign up for an evening's uh, online event in the middle of our Zoom universe uh, will come prepared to really weigh in and, and that we can figure out how to do it. My role in the in the economic diversification will not be to talk at all. I'm there to listen and to try to make sure that we capture the best of what the discussion leads us to. And so that's my call to action. And I won't sign off, Ryan, without answering the the fastball that you asked Adam to send me. Yeah. Because uh, it is because it is related actually. I got involved with Bitcoin well. Uh, because I saw an exciting team of people uh, that will be the leaders of the next generation of leadership uh, working in an emerging area that I did not know enough about uh, that expresses part of a future plan. Uh, and I got involved. And what I'm enjoying the most about it is that every single interaction I have with them, I'm learning more. Um, and and that to me is is why i'm also involved in this process uh it's it's how i select where i spend my time these days is thing the future uh will belong to my grandchildren uh, but it's really exciting to learn more about it and to try to contribute and i that would be my other call to action is that people take a long-term view yeah I like that word select. How do you, that's a great question to ask anybody. Uh, you could learn a lot about a person by asking them how they select where they spend their time or where they invest their time. Uh, Salima, 
the call to action from you today, right now, what is it? Come join us and uh, and join us in the spirit of uh, humility of looking for answers, but not actually having them. And so um, I just, I really, I love uh, the next 30. And if you're into being in that space of, of possibilities um, and, and into that space of, of asking really great open-ended questions so that we can understand why. Why don't we have the best facilities for neuro, neurodiverse kids? Why don't we have um, um, an awesome system of, of proper healthcare uh, to, to be able to manage a pandemic and get a vaccine out quickly? Why, why, why? Uh, let's ask these questions and let's sit in the space of asking the questions and not jump to the answers. I think it, that's the time. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're hoping for. And if you're into it, come and join us. All right, Chad, we'll give you last word on this, my man. Thank you. I. I think my point here will be about um, the mindset we use as we approach this. And what I would say is uh, what I like about the framing here is we're kind of asking what does the future require of us? Uh, and I would encourage us to, to, um, to use that framing as we're approaching these conversations for sure. And we definitely want you to come out to them, but just in general, um, you know, there's a lot of attention rightly so on the problems we face right now. And, and we need to have that attention, but we can't let our our focus on today's problems um, obscure uh, or, or, or kind of um, help make us lose sight with the fact that uh, we need to be uh, to have in mind what the future requires of us. And I like the idea of hearing more from young people. We're going to design that into the sessions as well, by the way. Um, so if there are any young people, uh, you know, I mean, we all consider ourselves young, I suppose, but, um, you know, high school, university age uh, people that are listening in, we really, really want you to come because we want to hear from you. This is about the next 30, as in the next 30 years, young people have the greatest stake in that future. Um, so, yeah, my encouragement is to is for us all to rise to the occasion by thinking about what the future requires of us. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, broadcast entities and a lot of businesses keep their their demographic data really close to their chest. It's proprietary data. I'm really proud to tell you uh, about some of the data that we know about about our Real Talk panel, the people that participate in the Y Station question of the week. Let me tell you this. If you're looking to reach young people, um, we know of the 4,351 people that completed our question of the week last week, 19% were under the age of 34. 78% were under the age of 55. Isn't that amazing? So 80% of our audience is under the age of 55. So if you want to talk to people, engaged Western Canadians, engaged Albertans that are going to care a great deal about what the province looks like over the next 30 years, this is the place to find them. Uh, my thanks to uh, Chad Park. Um, my thanks to Carmen McNary and, and of course, Salima Kassam for joining us. You can check out the next30.ca. And again, that engagement session, uh, the first one, the possibility panel uh, next week, midweek, you can check it out on Wednesday night. Thanks for this, you three. We appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having us on, Ryan. You bet. And and real talkers, thank you. Um, can can I just say I'm a little used to, and I don't want to say I'm used to it because I tried to never get used to it. Uh, but but uh, you know, talk radio text lines where it's just it's that sort of binary thing that Chad was talking about. However, you feel about you know harm reduction or property tax increases or sales taxes or uh, whatever coal mining in the Rocky Mountains. It, it's either you're for or against. You know, you're either brilliant or an absolute moron. Like there's there there was no middle ground. There was no discussion. And what I'm seeing from you. I don't know what to make of it. I almost don't want to talk about it because I don't want to jinx it. But but our audience, Sam, what do you like? I know that, you know, part of like you do like 11 jobs here. Um, actually, probably closer to 15 different jobs. But you, it varies. One, depending on what's going on that day. You do such a good yeah. job. One of one of your jobs is to as best you can keep an eye on the on our on our, you know, uh, live comment, you know, basically our, our YouTube chat mm -hmm. and moderate it and. You know, from time to time, you have to jump in and, and take care of something. But for the most part, have you even seen people respecting each other in disagreement as much as you see with this community? I I think I booted one comment today. Yeah, like I think, you know, we're we're we have a great batting average today. Um, no, it, it, it's I mean, we talk about this all the time. It's a it's an unbelievably respectful discourse. And, and I would say, Ryan, and, and you would probably agree with me, is that when we launched this show, I don't think we thought 
the YouTube comment thread would editorially become a very important part of the show. But, you know, the live feedback, uh, hearing from people in real time, you know, it, it's basically the text line without the, uh, with, with, without the... <laughs> The, uh, the the muck and the, the mire. Muck and the, I was going to say without the racism filter applied, but I mean it's not even just that. You know what I mean? It's like we we have this very respectful discourse. We have this group of regulars. We have new people that come into the fold and they're welcomed by our yeah, regulars. They're That's welcomed. That's the other by, thing. I know. I love about it is just you know we get new people joining in every day, and it's a community that wants them to be a part of it. Okay, so let me ask you this, so everybody's clear. You said you only had to block one comment today. What earns you a block? on real talk. I mean, it's to a certain degree, it's a judgment call. There's the obvious ones like, you know, horrific profanity, racism, misogyny. Yeah. So, I mean, like all, all the obvious stuff, but what, 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 you don't have to get into the comment today. I didn't see it, but, but I think the comment was just a subscribe to my channel comment. Uh, YouTube gives you a lot of people that are just, they'll, oh, they'll jump I onto see. any live I see. chat okay. to self promote. So like those ones I boot right away if, if, you know, if now, if somebody comes on and says, hey, I've done some research on this topic, you should check out this website. That's like, great. That's not self-promotion. That's keeping the commentary going. That's keeping the discussion going. It's, it's just, you know, people that just jump on and they very much just want to disrupt and be a troll. Those guys get out right okay away. got it i love it um so thank you to everybody all of the real talkers that are pushing uh, like now scott's trying to but now scott's trying to pick fights after all of that after i encourage you stop scott's trying to pick fights on here and he says he loves pineapple on pizza you know he says specifically hawaiian pizza you know and and, and now heather's taking a shot at tartar sauce like you i just complimented you all on your civility and now you're wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. now you're you, taking runs at big tartar. You asked for discourse and you got upset when it's against the things you believe in. That's right. That's right. <laughs> because there is only one opinion on hiking tartar sauce into the backwoods of the Canadian Rockies, and that is pro tartar. I am pro big tartar. You know, if we're if we're just continuing on the chain of positivity right now, I've been wanting to say all morning. I love your jacket. Oh, that is a thank you. That is just a spectacular, beautiful sort of rusty earth tone pattern. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Santa brought me this jacket, and this is the first time uh, my my partner in life, Carrie, as a matter of fact, this morning said, why have you not yet worn? Because it's not called a I wish she was here so she could say the right word. It's a what do you call it when you combine two words? Is that if anybody knows it in this room, it's going to be you like a portmanteau. <laughs> I don't even know what that is, but but where you like. Um, what's in it like a jackalope sure yeah yeah um, of course that's the first one that comes to mind but but it's this is called like a is it a shacket or a jert like a sh it's like a shirt jacket or a yeah, jacket because I, I see what you mean it's like it looks like it's just like an insulated shirt it's an insulated shirt is what it is yeah and so she and so she says to me like why haven't you worn it yet and what she means is why haven't you worn it on real talk because I think she thinks that Santa would feel pretty good to know that i appreciated the gift that he brought me um and 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 i had sort of envisioned this as more like a um campfire chic you know like it, ha you, it has that vibe it has kind of a campfire chic look to it but but it's casual friday here on real talk and so you know there you have it that's why i'm wearing it um sean's wondering have we outright banned anybody is a block permanent uh i don't think so have we? Uh, you would know. I wouldn't yeah, know. I, I have not outright banned anybody. But we could. We could. I mean, if you start acting... Like, I can click that button. Don't take that as a challenge. Yeah. Daniel said he was he was curious about the block as well. Um, I, it's It's got me thinking, too, because people were talking about uh, Agriculture Minister Devin Dreeshen. Are our scientists ready to go, by the way? Oh, yeah. Okay, I shouldn't... He says, oh, yeah. I shouldn't keep him waiting this long. But people were talking about Devin Dreeshen and like, should, he's blocking all his constituents. He's blocking all these people. And, and to a certain degree, an elected official shouldn't elected official block people i think it depends right people are a nurse wrote in to say remember this was on trash talk last week uh, which is coming up uh, a nurse said i'm a nurse i'm an rn and i questioned the health minister tyler shander on twitter and he blocked me and she said and now i don't have access to public health information released by the health minister because i'm blocked and i kind of went okay i mean that sounds kind of eh. but then also there are off the top of my head i mean you can check it on your twitter i, I checked i think i have a, i've blocked about 600 people um, over the course of the 10 years I've been on Twitter, I've got about, I don't know what it is, 46, 47,000 people following me, about 600 people are blocked. Um, I don't apologize for any of them. 
Um, if, if you're blocked, in my opinion, a guy came up to me once at a hockey game and said, hey, man, I'm here to make peace. Could you unblock me? And I went, ah, uh, I went, you know, I said, well, let's let's find out. Let's find the tweet that got you blocked. So he searched his handle and my handle. And sure enough, he deserved to be blocked. He was talking about my son that you're going to get blocked. If, if, if you know, if you don't, say don't, right, don't don't bring people, you're going to get blocked. He, oh, po- he apologized to my face. We shook hands. COVID wasn't a thing yet. And, and now he follows me. And as a matter of fact, I follow him. And it turns out he had a he had a low moment and he apologized for taking a shot at my son or invoking my son. Uh, I said, OK. But I don't, you know, if you're if you're violent, if you're if if you're if, if you're an asshole, basically, um, I'm not going to apologize for blocking you, and I'll block you. So to a certain degree, we say should politicians block people or not block people? I think there's nuance to it. I don't think it's a yes or no. Um, we're going to talk to a couple scientists in just a second. Right now, I want to remind you that if you're looking to breathe easy this weekend and moving forward, CleanAirClub.ca is the destination you want to check out. How many of us ignore or just lose track? of the fact that our furnace filters need to be changed on a regular basis. Well, they figured out a way to make it nice and easy for you. They basically manage your schedule on your behalf. They even drop off the filter replacements at your front door. All you have to do is sign up at cleanairclub.ca. Give them the size of the filter you need. They handle the rest. Save money, breathe easy with Clean Air Club. Also want to let you know that it's the time of year where everybody's looking outside, isn't it? We're looking at our backyard. We're envisioning what it could look like. Well, this is where Eden Landscaping comes in. They are adapting to these unique times and they're using uh, tools like Zoom and even Google Earth to help you plot out what your dream outdoor space could look like. They've been in the game for 20 years and they're doing small projects like flower boxes all the way to big dream home builds. Now's the time to get started by visiting landscapeedmonton.ca or just check out the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. That's also where you'll find Alta Moving and Storage. If this is the time, if through the course of this bizarre 2020 you've decided it's time to declutter or maybe even move why not let the team of local entrepreneurs at alta moving and storage take the stress away for you they have these pod style moving containers they drop them off at your house they can provide movers if you need and then of course they can handle you all the way through including long and short-term storage solutions check out alta moving and storage of course you can check out altastorage.ca or again the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com all right i talked to robin campbell yesterday president of the coal association of canada we're going to talk to two scientists here in just a moment Uh, but first we wanted to tee up a portion of the interview uh, where mr campbell addressed some of the concerns around selenium uh, an element leaking into the water It's, it's it's undeniable he didn't deny that it happens as a result of open pit mining on the eastern slopes of the rocky mountains here's how the exchange went before we fact check it We've heard from a whole bunch of different people. Um, you know, David Luff was on yesterday, one of the architects of the coal policy in the 70s under Lougheed. We've talked to ranchers. We talked to journalist uh, Andrew Nicky Fork, who obviously has no time for this type of project. Are, are you taking issue with, with what, what these folks are suggesting about selenium in the water and about disruption to the, the mountains and about the, what they call sort of the farce of, of, of uh, you know, putting this all back together and turning it back into uh, you know, what they might describe as, as an acceptable version of what was there before. Do you believe that, that people are not telling the truth about some of these environmental concerns? Well, you know, I mean, uh, what's, uh, what is selenium? Ask the average person what selenium is, and if they can give you an answer. I'm not a scientist, but basically it's salt. And so you have a leaching of, uh, of salt into the water from the uh, pits of in mind. And people can continue to compare the Elk Valley to the eastern slopes of the Rockies. And as I've said before, it's apples and oranges. Uh, okay, so you know, that was the Elk Valley. You have that was Robin Campbell. I wanted to give you a sense, basically. And if you want to see the full interview, I'm not cutting him off. Obviously, I've already talked to him. You can find that interview by subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can check out my Twitter profile. I put the two minute twenty second clip on there. But let's get to it. Is selenium just salt? Colton Vesey is an environmental geochemist. Uh, currently a PhD student at the University of Alberta in Earth and Atmospheric scientists, uh, Sciences. Uh, he has experience in the mining sector with contaminant reclamation. Uh, Colton, want to welcome you to the show, and thanks for making time for us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on to talk about this uh, big and controversial issue and to give some science background behind it. Well, that's what we want to basically get to the bottom of it and understand it. Uh, John Adcock is an independent environmental and engineering consulting professional, Uh, He's a professional biologist uh, based out of Edmonton, an entrepreneur and owner of ESP High Tech Incorporated. John, thanks for reaching out to the show. It's great to have you here. 
Absolutely. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You bet. I, I'm going to just basically hand it over to the two of you so you can speak freely, take us into this. And, and, and maybe if I can, can ask you to kind of make it accessible to those of us that, that, that uh, barely passed Bio 30. Uh, I'm talking about myself. John, why don't we start with you? Because you were the first to reach out to the show. Uh, was what Robin Campbell said yesterday accurate? Uh, I'm sure to him it's accurate um, in the role that he's in right now. Uh, And I'm sure to the average person that might sound reasonable. Uh, But when you ask a chemist what selenium is, uh, they're going to give you a different answer. And if you ask me, a biologist, what selenium is, I'm going to probably give you a little different answer. And I'm sure Colton's going to even say something a little different. Um, Yes, selenium can be seen as salts in the environment. uh, But there is also, I mean, any item... Any, any material, any element, any molecule is a poison in the right concentration. So we have to keep that in mind all the time. Okay, so concentration is the key here, right? So if you were to, if you were to take a, a quarter cup of selenium and sprinkle it into a babbling brook, uh, you may not cause enormous repercussions, but if there were to be a significant and recurring or perpetual leak of it, then what would we be looking at? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's a, a good way to look at it. Uh, when, when you rip the top of a mountain off for a coal mine like this and, and you're talking about tons and tons and tons and tons of overburden and debris, um, yeah, this is a, this is a giant le- leachable material that's just sitting there. Um, they, don't, they don't treat this stuff the way that a hazardous material would be treated. And, uh, I mean, it's just dirt to them. Okay, uh, Colton, you're an expert here uh, in, in the mining sector and specifically with contaminant reclamation, which is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, so, so let me ask you the same question to kick this off that, that I asked John. Was, was Robin Campbell accurate yesterday in his assessment of selenium and its environmental impact? Um, <clears throat> I, I agree with John where if you ask different people, they have different opinions on what it might be and how it interacts in the environment. But in my opinion, with my background in geochemistry, selenium is not a salt. Um, And I think saying that it is kind of undermines the uh, potential toxic implications that it could have for the environment. Um, First of all, it's, it's actually a metalloid on the periodic table. It's right beside arsenic, which is another contaminant concern of a lot of mining environments. Absolutely. Um, and if it was just a salt, then why have so many companies and countries around the world worked and put billions of dollars in reclamating and remediating, remediating water quality? In tech, for example, they spent at least over $100 million on the reclamation projects and water remediation, and they're still struggling to get that under control. It's a, it's a hard, hard issue. And I think lastly, one, one last quick comment on that is I, I think saying that it's a salt kind of disrespects the millions of people globally who are impacted by selenium, whether that's through selenium deficiencies or people's livelihoods who've been affected directly from mine contamination. Colton, can I ask you to get into that? I mean, assume that we, that we don't have the background that you have when, when you talk about the impact around the world and, and, and either deficiencies or an overabundance of it and the impact on people and health and industry, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so as John was saying, I mean, when you, when you disturb large, large portions of land and you dig up lots of waste rock to get at the ore below it, you have to store that somewhere. But inside that waste rock, there's an abundance of different types of minerals um, that contain different types of contaminants. And over weathering, they can be released into the environment through different ways. Um, the most common mineral that some people might be familiar with is called pyrite. People like to collect it as a gemstone. Um, but a lot of times it contains, this is where the selenium and other contaminants concerned are actually hosted. And as that oxidizes and in, in, in with air, it will release the selenium and potentially arsenic as well, depending on the system. And then that can enter the environment if there's not appropriate um, uh, reclamation techniques and water quality checks ab- above the discharge. John, when we talk about, I mean, can you, in, in layperson's terms, describe the environmental and the health effects of strip mining? 
like, uh, first of all, when we talk about uh, again, so I've, I'm not a miner. I know that may surprise some people, but but there's no coal under my fingernails here. Um, I don't even have any calluses on my hands and you can make fun of me if you must. Uh, but when we talk about open pit mining and strip mining, is that the same thing? And what are the environmental impacts like what happens to air and land and water and and ultimately what happens to to animal populations, including human beings? Absolutely. Great question. Um, well, there's, there's a couple of different things that I think that, that need to be for, before we get into that, Ryan, I just want to finish off on the selenium thing. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that selenium, when, when we're doing consulting after a project is active and we find selenium, we, we use that as an indicator molecule, um, an indicator species that, it, it, it usually is a, is a material that we use to say that, okay, there's going to be something else going on here. If that's leached out of the, ma- the material that we're, that we're looking at, there's way bigger problems here than selenium, arsenic, lead, mercury. Um, if you look at the, the fishing guidelines in Alberta, it's stated right in the book not to eat uh, over so many fish caught from a certain regions. And the reason for that isn't natural. We live in Alberta. Um, it's industrial and, and that's what it's from. So, uh, so, so we're so not having, we, we're not having as, as full of a conversation almost as we need to. Like, I think this is absolutely, I, I'm experiencing a wake up call right now, even with you saying that everyone's talking about selenium, but that's not even the biggest thing we need to be focusing on. So, I mean, you know, it kind of feels like nobody's really talking about this, maybe except for this show. John, but but help us really hone in on what we need to be focusing on because we need to be able to talk to our MLAs and we need to be able to talk to the environment minister and the premier and the government and industry and everybody else about this with an understanding of what the issues really are. This is where you two come in so importantly, John. Absolutely. Uh, the the I think where we where we should start is is in Alberta. We have a fairly rigorous process for any project impl- implementation, whether it be oil and gas, nuclear, wind. Or a, or a mine project like this, and it's called the environmental impact assessment process. Now, it's fairly rigorous and it's fairly good, but when you just declassify certain lands that were classified as untouchable before, with no reason, I, I want to know who made the decision and how, what parameters you used to come to that decision. Why was it more sensitive 40 years ago than it is now? When, when it's it's obviously, I mean, you can see the impacts of what we've done for the last 40 years here, and it's not pretty. We have abandoned orphaned wells all over the province um, and it's billions of dollars. And even though they put all this money into trust funds with goodwill and good intent with these projects, when they start, they don't always end up that way. Well, I think one thing that we know is that they may be putting some money away, but it is undeniable that there is not nearly enough squirreled away uh, to, to clean up Alberta's orphan wells, so much so that we're appealing now to the federal government that doesn't treat us fairly, rem- remember everybody, that's swooping in with hundreds of millions of dollars so we can clean up the own mess uh, that we created by allowing corporations to come in and walk away when it, when, it, when it lacks profitability. And again, a reminder, every time you see W. Brett Wilson sounding off on Twitter, remind him to clean up his orphan wells. So, Colton, you've been big on reclamation here. How do we do on it? Uh, Alberta's uh, Minister of Agriculture, Devin Dreeshan, uh, you, now, you'd think that farmers might be concerned about things like watersheds and pollution. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture says, well, you just after you've after you've done the disruption in mind, he says you just tamp down the, the rock again. He says you sprinkle grass seed. This is not a joke. He says you sprinkle grass seed. And he said it might actually be better grazing for the animals than it was before. Um, you study this. Is that a thing? No, it's that's definitely not a thing, and uh, I'm sure John can also agree to that. Being a consulting, uh, consultants take their job very seriously, and they, they do follow regulations very well. Um, no, it's a much more complicated issue, and I, I'm not a biologist by training, but I mean I understand that you companies are required to restore the land to what they previously were, and that that um, it's impossible. Part of that, yeah, it's impossible, but it also there's a lot of contributions. Like there's different plant species different uh, wildlife that were there originally. Um, so you can't just sprinkle grass seed and hope it'll grow back and put cattle on it because that that's not reclaiming the land, actually. That's making it into a prairie, which all of the prairie environments have been disturbed as well through agriculture. 
it has to do with intended land use and that's why this 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 changing of the land use or the the land criteria the category two and three lands it's so it's a i mean i think it should it should upset all our burdens we didn't get a say in this Nobody campaigned on uh, coal mining in the Rocky Mountains. Nobody campaigned. On, I mean, and, and then here's the thing is, is you know, I know it, it, the, the funny thing is the way that gaslighting works is that the people that are holding the gaslight, they, they want you to believe that that you're the one that's lost your mind in asking fair questions. And so when Albertans are saying all this stuff and, and it's obviously it's it's confused, there, there's there's you're flying in the in the haze and it's on purpose and it's intentional. Uh, by lawmakers about parks, you know, are parks being sold? Well, they're not being sold. They're being decommissioned. And, 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 and that means that they're being returned to crown land status. Well, here's the thing is it's probably difficult to sell the public on coal mining in parks. It's not as difficult to sell the public on coal mining on crown land. And so decommissioning the parks might actually have nothing to do with saving money. And it might have everything to do with handing out contracts to people. So, I mean, these are the types of straight lines that I think Albertans are starting to draw here. You think I might be on to something? Bingo. Absolutely. So what does the public need to say, Colton? I mean, ultimately, you know, I asked our previous panel here, what's the call to action? I mean, you're, you're a person that, yeah, your professional life centers around this type of thing, but you also live here. You breathe the air. You drink the water. Uh, what do you want people to take into the weekend? What should people be asking their elected representatives about? Yeah, I, I mean, I... I grew up in southern Alberta in Okotoks. I spent a lot of time in the mountains. It means a lot to me. Um, and that was part of the reason why I got into the field I am now, to care for the environment. Um, there's a lot of ways people can get involved. Um, I believe there's a petition that's ending today by on the House of Commons. And there's also the open comments that can be left uh, for the government on the assessment impact page. Um, and also, I mean, People can always reach out to scientists as well. It, we're always happy to answer questions and engage with the public. It's an important part of our job is to um, deliver the science and the facts to, to people in this province and country. Uh, John, agree with you, Colton. John, give us something to take from this. Um, I, I think we have to decide as a community here in Alberta what our legacy is going to be. Hmm. I mean, pretty simple do we want to cut the tops of the mountains off <laughs> I, you can't put it back guys like you when, put it back. when you ask it like that <laughs> right i mean there's the argument well, we can't put it back yeah no i know and 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 you know i mean here's the thing so you go like you know alberta's got a, a, an ample abundance we, we have that's redundant we have an abundance of coal uh there's demand for coal there are people that are out of work We've mined coal in Alberta and BC and to a certain degree Saskatchewan for many, many years. Um, there are coal mines that are active now. Uh, there are people that are feeding their families. I mean, there's all these arguments, right? I asked Robin Campbell about this yesterday. He said, he said these miners are kinsmen and community and soccer coaches and they pay taxes. And that's not to me. I mean, ask Aaron Brockovich. That's not to me an, an excuse for polluting uh, the environment. Uh, but it's not a shot. Like Corb Lund said, it's not a shot against the riggers and the people driving the trucks. They do have to feed their families. But when you boil Absolutely. when you boil it down, John, and I'll get out of your way so you can answer my question here, or you, you can respond to my stream of consciousness. Uh, when well, you ask it that plainly, do we want to be chopping off the tops of our mountains? I mean, no, obviously how else to look no. at it. How else do you want to look at it? Like obviously no. So I guess where do you find that sweet spot? Um, I guess that's the that's the real kicker. I mean, we've we've tried quite a few different coal mining. Uh, venues in this province um, some have worked and they've employed people for for many years and it's been uh, you know it's been it's been great community builders uh, but if you drive through a place like Cadman or Edson or, or Grand Cash right now um, I think you'll see what happens John Adcock is a professional biologist. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, the owner of ESP High Tech. They do environmental and uh, and engineering consulting. And then uh, Colton uh, Vessi, I'm appreci appreciative uh, that both of you reached out. Colton, obviously a friend of the show here um, and, and a student, uh, a, a PhD student at the U of A in earth and atmospheric scientist, uh, an expert when it comes to, to reclamation and when it comes to the impact of the mining sector on our lands and our waters included. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for this. Have a wonderful weekend. We appreciate the clarity. Thank you for having me.
Yeah, thank you. You bet. Have a good day. So there you have it, Real Talkers. Uh, pretty fulsome conversation all in on coal this week, and we'll be continuing to take on issues that matter next week. And a big part of that is what you put on our radar. Um, both of those individuals, both of those experts, of course, we vet our guests to make sure that everybody is who they, they are who they said they were. Uh, and those two really brought it today, but both of them reached out to us by way of talk at ryanjesperson.com. Both of them saw the interview yesterday with the president of the Coal Association of Canada, and both of them said, uh, we would like to contribute our expertise to this discussion, and we are richer for it. Uh, you can always be in touch with the show, and we take your uh, suggestions seriously on content you would like to hear. Uh, if you go to ryanjesperson.com, you can also send us an email by following the link. It's also where you'll find the links to subscribe, uh, to follow me, to follow Sam on Twitter, to subscribe to our YouTube and to subscribe to our podcast anywhere you download your podcast. We're so grateful for that. And of course, if you feel inclined, uh, we also have our Patreon there. If you'd like to kick in five bucks a month, some of you giving us 20 bucks a month, which is so, we're so grateful for it. It's allowing us to, can I give a peek? I, I guess I should give a peek behind the curtain. We've conducted three interviews this week. <laughs> the team is growing. Uh, and so we're very excited about that. And we're able to do that because of you and because of your support on our Patreon. So thank you for that. Uh, it's also a result of the sponsorship of our incredible partners like Park Power, uh, who are in the Internet game the natural gas game, and of course the electricity game. They have been since 2013 and ever since they started a 10% profit sharing commitment, 10% of their profits they share with local community groups, nonprofits right here in the province of Alberta. You got to pay somebody for these services. Why not take it to Park Power? And if you go to parkpower.ca, they're going to sweeten the pot even more. They're going to give you 70 bucks off your first bill. All you do, it doesn't matter if it's residential or commercial, when you sign up, just use the promo code 2021 Real Talk. 2021 Real Talk is the promo code 70 bucks off your first bill at parkpower.ca. And of course, we always read the spot for local waste last on friday buckle up everybody because local waste is the proud presenter of trash talk you know they've been in the waste management game recycling too for more than a quarter century locally owned and operated working with the small businesses all the way up to the huge ones like malls and they want to come up with a solution that fits you a price structure that fits you so give them a call localwaste.ca or 780-242-9746 so you ready to rock and roll you want to get into this one let's do it All right, earmuffs on, kids, because this week's edition of Trash Talk, these are emails we receive. Talk at ryanjesperson.com is spicy. Like this one from Perfecho. Perfecho says, another broken promise of listening to the grassroots. Fire chiefs, EMS, municipalities, mayors, and Reeves, people way closer to issues at a local level than the provincial government are concerned about the effects of the 911 changes. I trust them to know what's best for my family's protection. I do not trust the Alberta government. Perfecto says, I'm truly concerned more than I've ever been about policy changes being made, not to benefit Albertans, but for friends of the UCP. Says, if COVID were not an issue, there'd be way more visible protests, but that's illegal right now that from perfecto this one from larry who says the most concerning thing to me with regards to the mining in the rockies is the lack of consultation consulting the people of alberta actually affected by this many of us no longer trust our representatives in the assembly see the theme says we're looking out for albertans best interest we are but they're not says i understand alberta won't even benefit substantially from this the job numbers not substantial why are we risking so much for so little larry says in closing many albertans have lost faith that Premier Kenny's doing what's best for Alberta. Polls support the statement, and I would really hope that MLAs in Alberta realize this. That from Larry. How about this from Marion? Marion says, I just don't get this government. She says, who's voting for them? Oil and gas CEOs? She says, I'm a retired teacher and I'm so pissed about my pension. I'm seething mad about Robin Campbell's take on coal mining, Ryan. I live in northern Alberta. Uh, she says, I love our province. I want my grandkids and my great grandkids. All right, Marion, to enjoy the province just the way it is today. I will be contacting my MLA again. That from Marion. Well done. And how about this one from Janelle? Earmuffs, kids. 
She says, I am seething. I am seething over the complete disregard that Kenny has for Albertans. Teachers are consistently shit on in this province. I saw it firsthand growing up watching my mom. She taught for 40 years. Now I see my brother and his wife, both of them teachers, going through it as well. People do not become teachers for the benefits. They don't go to university just to get a job with two months off. People who become teachers do it because they love it. She says, how fucking awesome is Jason Zakowski that you had on the show? The scientist with the dogs. She says that kind of passion to educate comes from within. And there's no amount of summer vacations that inspire that type of gift. Teachers constantly deal with our government's complete disregard and undermining of their profession, knowledge, and passion. They brave it under threats of job cuts and job losses because they see value in our kids. She says, you think for a second, if things go to shit under AIMCO, that teachers' pensions will be saved under this government in this province? She says, are you kidding? kidding me? She says, let's keep in mind, this is the government that kiboshed Puff funding for kids that need it most. If Kenny and Good Conscience can cut Puff funding, funding for kids with disabilities, you think he gives a shit about you? The average Albertan, he does not. She says, sincerely, not a teacher, says Jan, but I'm an Albertan who values them. And she says, oh, and by the way, speaking of hypocrisy, we're canceling life-saving supervised consumption sites, but when the traveling, uh, when addressing travel during a pandemic, the premier says, let's be safe. People will do it anyway because of money. Jan says, hard no to that bullshit. K, thanks. Bye. That from Jan. Talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you send us the emails for Trash Talk. It's presented by Local Waste, and we will talk to you Monday at 8.30 Mountain Time. Have a great weekend.